This is Eternal Curse by R. L. Wilson. Narrated by Sarah Guise. Prologue. Hell yeah, I need some money. I'm 17, homeless, and hungry. Barry slides me a piece of paper across the lunch table. I tear it open, and it's a telephone number with Prentice at the top. The local Mr. Everything. Got bills? Call Prentice. Getting bullied? Call Prentice. He is sort of the president of the supernatural world. You sure I should call him? I yell. The lunchroom is always noisy. Two hundred teens in the cafeteria at one time is a recipe for disaster. What do you have to lose? He stood from the table and pulled his pants up before grabbing his lunch tray. Nothing, I guess. It's better to know you're going to eat tonight than wonder. I'll catch you later, Barry says before making his way out of the double doors. This is a terrible idea. I lean back in the chair. Glaring at the number, my choices are clear. Either I call him or go home, the last place I want to go. Mama has kicked me out for the last time. I have a book bag with two sets of clothes, a couple of granola bars, and a cell phone to my name. I've stayed with a different friend every night for the past two weeks. I need my own money, my own place to stay. I leave school to give him a call. Rapid, sharp pain sizzled in my abdomen. I'm shaking nervous. I'm a complete stranger calling to ask for a job. I do have some magic powers so maybe I could offer my healing services for pay. Walking down the street, I shiver in the cold air. My jacket is thin with holes in the pockets, and I don't have any gloves. It sucked being a homeless teen. I grab my cell phone, hesitate, take a deep breath, and then dial his number. Hello, can I speak to Prentice? My palms grow moist with sweat. Speaking, how may I help you? My name is Harmony. Harmony! He cuts me off. I've been awaiting your call. You have? Sure. Meet me at the McDonald's on the corner of 7th Avenue at 4 o'clock. I should have walked away when he pulled up in a white Hummer. Standing on the corner, I'm surrounded by darkness. It lurks in every nook and crack. I had no clue the biggest snake would be sitting in that fancy SUV, wearing a $300 suit with an overpriced tie. I'm sure I seem quite irresponsible, but at this point, I'm desperate. The tinted back window lowers, exposing a big hand. The hand waves in a motion for me to come over. This must be him, I thought. Why the hell doesn't he show his face? I'm kind of creeped out. I'm not sure who's sitting in the back of the car. I slip my hands in my pockets and walk closer to the car. Shivering and sweating, I bend over to take a peek. The car was dark, but I could tell it was Prentice. I had seen him around. He even came to my middle school once, when I was 11. He came for career day. Get in. I hesitate and then pop the door open. Slipping into the back seat made me tense. The car had that new car scent. I thought he was rich. The car, the clothes, and the thick build, he wouldn't understand my struggle. Maybe he has never had grumbling hunger pains or the holy socks. I hear you got some financial problems. The lights in the car dim so I can't get a good look at his face. Truly, I couldn't see his eyes. I really wanted to see his eyes to know if he was sincere or not. Yeah, I kind of do. You looking for some work? I grimace. It depends on what type of work. Relax, it's nothing illegal. He slips his hand into the inside pocket of his coat. He flicks a piece of paper and a pen toward me. The streetlights glint off his watch. A shiny gold one. I know you can perform magical healings. I need help healing. He shrugs. I wipe the sweat from my forehead. Great, that's just what I had in mind. 
The main thing is, how much is he going to pay me? I need enough money to eat. How much will you pay me? First, let's take care of the business. You sign these papers. He indicates the paper and a pen. And I'll give you two grand right now. Two grand? As in thousands? Did he just say that? I must be tripping. I've never seen two thousand dollars in my life. I'll heal anybody for that. I take a big swallow. You mean two thousand dollars? His eyes dart around. Yeah. I snatch the pen and paper. Where do I sign? Right here on the dotted line. Put the date next to your signature. He hands me a white envelope filled with crisp Ben Franklins. My heart skips a beat every time I count another hundred. I glance over in his direction. I swear flames danced in his irises. Little did I know I was signing my life away. With a measly two thousand dollars, he took advantage of me. I was so naive. My fate has been signed, sealed, and delivered. I'll have this century-old curse for eternity. Forever, I'm bonded to the devil. Chapter One Two Years Later I hold my breath as I dice onions on the stainless steel counter, waiting to get back on the register. The smell of fried burgers makes my stomach churn. Terry walks in, wearing his usual tight slacks and blue-collared shirt. He's the worst manager here, always stalking over my shoulder and pointing out my mistakes, as if he doesn't have a ton of flaws. Harmony, you can get back on register three, he says. The overpowering pungency of the onions invades my nose as I walk to the sink to wash my hands before dashing to the register, sweat trickling down my face but my spirits lifting. I hate working in the hot, humid, greasy grill kitchen, and I can hear my co-workers chattering with envy behind me as I make my escape. The sound of embellished teenage laughter and overzealous conversation drifting through the restaurant reminds me of my high school days, back when life made sense. The town's slut trots towards my register, and I cringe, always loud and looking down her big nose at folks. Supposedly, a shifter knocked her up, but she hides it well. Her spandex top is so tight it could stop her circulation. Hey, I'll have a number three, please, she requests while bouncing around like a dizzy bee. She can't stand still. Sure. I glare at her while biting my tongue. The ding of the cash register fills the awkward silence as I enter her order and slip the change into her hand. The heated light blazing above the fries nearly burns my arm as I fill a medium order, then slap a greasy burger and a Coke on a brown tray before sliding it across the counter. Winston rushes into the restaurant in a frenzy. He's breathing fast and his face glistens with sweat. He's always been hairy, but no one has ever noticed he's a werewolf. Living in Silver Park has its advantages. Nearly everyone is a supernatural, and we blend in well. He grabs my hand. I need you now. Come quick. My heart thunders against my ribcage. Winston never comes to my job in a panic. I have a clue regarding what happened, and it's a disaster. I scan the room for Terry, locating him flipping burgers. I race to the back and grab my purse before stopping by the grill on my way out the door. I have to run, Terry. It's an emergency. His jaw drops and his eyes bore into mine. It's busy in the restaurant. He needed me to work. But I don't give him a chance to respond. I continue out the door with Winston. The sun had tucked itself behind the gray clouds, but no smell of rain. The howling wind blows dust throughout the air. My blonde hair with pink tips sways to the side of my face, causing my skin to itch. I slip a rubber band around my hair, getting prepared for whatever disaster is ahead. Winston's eyes dance with fear. The dragons came in and attacked a customer at my restaurant, he says while panting. The dragons were shifters that lived in paranormal communities, except they'd all linked together to form a gang. I've never seen one shift into a dragon, but Dad had, 
and he says some of them are huge with giant wings and could shoot fire 20 feet away. We continued sprinting toward his restaurant. I'm short-winded and my anxiety is kicking into high gear. But where's the protector of Silver Park? Where is Prentice? I ask while pulling my purse over my head. I called him. He told me to come and get you to heal the customer. His hair flew across his face, so he pushed it back. Winston's tall stature and long legs make it hard for me to keep up. I'm only five feet five inches with short legs. There's something about Prentice. He gives off negative vibes. All the paranormals admire Prentice. I don't. He is out for himself. He has an ulterior motive. I'm not sure what. But I have my eye on him. These dragons are getting out of control. I have a family to care for and a business to run. His forehead now flushes with wrinkles, showing his anger. The dragons have been out of control recently. Prentice needs to handle them. We continue racing through Night Heights, a subdivision where shifters live, and the kids come out at night and are safe to shift during full moons. I used to attend parties in the Heights when I was in high school, and the shifters partied hard. The houses are the same framed tri-levels with wrought iron fences. We get to Silver Park and there's a crowd standing outside Winston's pizza place. Constant chatter roars from the crowd. They peek through the glass, hoping to get a glimpse of the victim. Word spreads fast in small supernatural communities. A dragon injures a shifter. It's front page news. I follow behind Winston, trying to cut through the crowd. Excuse me! Excuse me! Let us through! Winston barks. It seems like the entirety of Silver Park is outside the restaurant. Where was everyone when the dragon attacked the victim? We need to stand together. Instead, we expect Prentice to handle everything. And he does. However, it comes with a price. We make it inside and my heart sinks. A lifeless body lies on the floor. The palpable tension engulfed the room as the onlookers crowd around, gasping in fear. The place reeked of pizza and stale cigarettes. I cover my nose, waving away the gross aroma. I sprint past three tables, racing to the man's side. He lies flat on his back, with his head propped up on a towel, his face flushed. What should I do? He's hanging on by a thread. His right arm is blackened from a dragon burn. Small open areas of flesh and blood seep onto the floor. I've healed dragon burns before, but not one this severe. I don't know if I'm skilled enough for this tragedy. I assess his body for more burns. I only notice the huge burn covering his hand and the entire right forearm. He grimaces, his blue eyes fading. I imagine the pain he's enduring. I've never received a dragon burn before, but heard it's the worst. He grabs my hand, his grip firm. I check his pulse. It's faint but steady. The light glints, exposing his handsome features. His face is free from wrinkles, and he appears to be in his late twenties. Give her some room, everyone outside, Winston says. The crowd disperses. Now I can perform the healing. I haven't seen him around Silver Park. Maybe he lived in Night Heights. Pass me a bottled water, I ask Winston. I extract my hand from the man's grip. Winston brings the bottled water. I cut my hands together and Winston pours water in my palms. I rub the water between my fingers. As I dip into the magic at the very center of my being, calmness and cleansing consumes me. The flow of energy is suffocating within me. I put my hands on the patient and zap my energy into him. I locate the problem. There's an internal burn. This is a third-degree dragon burn. It shakes me to my core. I hope I can heal this man in time. I'm not sure if he has a family, but his life lays in the palm of my hands. Blood continues to puddle on the floor, flowing faster now. Dark, rough spots similar to tree bark encircle his arm. My heart rate kicks up a notch. Sweat clings to my forehead and the nape of my neck. Winston's blabbing fades in and out. My focus is on the man dying before my eyes. I scrape my finger against his rough arm. 
but I continue holding his arm until the bleeding ceases. He grimaces, snatching his hand away. I haven't fully healed him, and if he doesn't let me finish, he'll be in big trouble. Bangs on the window startle me as fear skitters up my spine. The last thing I want on my conscience is a death, especially not a fellow supernatural. Winston opens the door and yells, Let her do her job! to the crowd, who demand to know if everything is okay. Come back in an hour! He shouts while slamming the door. What's his name? I ask. I need to talk to him and calm him down. His body is stiff as a board. Patrick is his name. I lean in close and whisper in his ear. I didn't want to startle him. Hi, Patrick. I'm Harmony. I'm a healer. Stay still and let me heal your wounds. His muscles relax at the sound of my voice. His gaze focuses on the ceiling, his irises now gray. His eyes blink sluggishly. I trail my finger down his arm and his skin weaves together layer by layer. His breathing slows and he blinks repeatedly. He's coming around, thank God. I almost lost him. He lets out a sigh. After I finish healing the man, the skin on his arm is tight and shiny, his original color replacing the blackened flesh, as well as his pale face finally gaining traces of its usual coloring. I wipe the sweat from my brow and exhale. I'm hoping any minute he will talk. He moves his arms and narrows his gaze on my face as I patiently wait for him to speak. He mutters, Thank you. Relax and take it slow. You need to rest. Fatigue hits me hard after healings. Lately, each time, it takes more energy. The patient feels weak, too, but his strength will recover in time. Those two words filled my heart with joy. It's one of the reasons I continue to offer my healing skills. The other reason is I'm forced to help Prentice with his illegal operations. Few supernaturals appreciate what I do to save lives. Some even have a sense of entitlement. But I don't owe anyone. Not even Prentice. In my opinion, the two grand he paid me covered six months of services, not two years. The side door opens. Then the wind flows in as the bell rings out announcing a new arrival. Winston didn't yell, so it's someone he recognizes. I continue sitting on the floor at Patrick's side, unwilling to acknowledge the person who walked in. The footsteps arrive within my range of view, and I glare at the black boots standing beside me. I breathe in the scent of decaying flesh. No need to tell me who the asshole standing beside me is. Chapter 2 Prentice, thank God you came! Winston says. I continue watching Patrick as his breathing returns to normal. I glare over at Prentice. He wears a black suit with a red tie. Does he think he's a politician? He walks around as if he owns the place. He is tall, muscular, with a long black beard. Most people are only respectful towards him because they fear him. I'm momentarily confused by Winston's reaction. Why would Prentice's presence excite him? He did nothing. I'm doing the healings. I try to keep a straight face, avoiding a deep frown at the sight of Prentice. Of course I came. He extends his hand and shakes Winston's. Winston's eyes dance and the corner of his mouth curls into a smile. It's not like he's shaking the president's hand. How many people got hurt? Prentice asks. Just Patrick here. We need you around more often. They could attack any time. Are you okay? Do you want to sit in a chair? I ask Patrick. Yes. He nods. I'm better, Patrick says. He stands to his feet as his eyes dart around the room. His gaze stops at Prentice, his face sparkling like fireworks on the 4th of July. Prentice pulls a chair out and waves. Patrick hobbles over to the table and plops in the chair. Are you comfortable? Oh, now he's concerned. Ha ha. What a fucking disgrace. He has this whole town under a spell. 
Better. Uh, thanks, Mr. Prentice. Patrick says. I grab the towel and rise to my feet. I can't take this anymore. I'm tired and ready to go home. I want to apologize to everyone. I should do a better job protecting my community, Prentice says. He promises Winston he will make this right. He will keep the streets safe. Winston is smiling and nodding in adoration. What a fool. I'll do everything in my power to make the neighborhood safe. You will be able to raise your children for generations. He's a walking sales pitch and full of shit. I hand the towel to Prentice, then cross the red and white checkered tile in the direction of the door. He doesn't need to sell me anything. I'm already sold. I glance out the front window and find the crowd has disappeared, except for a woman holding a small child in her arms. She waves and smiles at me. Her face unfamiliar, I turn and glance at Winston. You want me to open the door? Winston pauses and has a puzzled expression on his face. It's obvious he's never seen the young woman before, but I couldn't leave her outside with an infant. That's my wife and daughter, Patrick mutters. Harmony, before you go anywhere, can I have a word with you? Prentice says, his tone harsh and intimidating. I stop in my tracks and let out a sigh. Sure. I don't want to talk to him, not in private. It makes me nervous. I follow him past the cash register into the kitchen. The heat from the kitchen is nearly melting the cover girl off my face. Several large pizza boxes sit on the counter. Three commercial size ovens are baking. Prentice folds his hands, leans against the counter, and glares at me. What battle are we facing? I shoot a stare his way. What do you mean? I slap my hands on my hips. I'm trying to let him know I'm not afraid of his bulky stature, but on the inside, I'm shaking with fear. He caresses his beard while staring at the ceiling. Who is responsible for this? I bite my tongue on what I wanted to say. Given the third-degree dragon burn, perhaps it's the dragons. The smoke from the oven drifts through the air, causing my eyes to water. He glares my way with wide green eyes. Dragons, huh? The dragons never wreak havoc on anyone without a reason. This has Prentice's name written all over it. Yeah, why are the dragons bothering us? I raised an eyebrow in his direction. Listen, I'm not the bad guy here. I'm trying to protect the supernaturals. He grabs his tie and loosens it. His voice lowers to a growl. Never said you were. Just curious why they're targeting us. My body now heats from his possessive tone. The dragons are trying to conquer territory. I made a move. It upset them. Yeah, the truth is he made a stupid move putting us all in danger. I don't need his protection. I didn't go around bullying people. I fight back a sneeze. Didn't anyone ever clean the oven around here? My plans were not to be stuck in a smoky kitchen talking with Prentice. I don't want any part of his crooked operation. I wish I could teleport back to the fateful day when I took his money in exchange for my services, not realizing I signed an eternal contract. Not to mention the lethargy. After every healing, the lethargy kicks into high gear. I want to be a normal 19-year-old, party, drink, and dye my hair funny colors. I want to run away and live my life, but Prentice won't give me away easily. I'm not important to him, but valuable. He wanted me for my power, my magic something no one else possessed. I'm the difference between a supernatural living or dying. Prentice grabs my arm. I glare at his hand and narrow my gaze at his face. An icy chill skitters up my back. I stay calm. Remember, it's between us, right? Darkness appears across his face, then an evil smile. You are tied to me. He points to my collar. The collar he put on my neck two years ago when he found out I had magic. Every time I try to take it off, I get sick. Sure.
I snatch my hand away and shoot a sharp stare at him, so hard it should leave a bleeding cut. I'll see you around. You sure will. He smiles, exposing his fangs. He's one bloodthirsty vampire I don't want in my presence. It annoys me how he shows his fangs whenever he talks to me. It's a scare tactic. I'm a young girl and he's a vampire. I must find a way out. I trot out of the kitchen into the dining room. Winston stands at the register taking an order from a customer. No one else is present. Patrick and his wife must have left. I scuttle to the bathroom and run cool water in my hands and pat my face. Water always gives me peace. I glare in the mirror at the small green tattoo. The tattoo is a six-pointed star with squiggly circles and lines. After every healing, the lines grow higher toward my neck, similar to a vine. I'm not sure what it means, but I need to figure it out soon. Coffee is imperative to shake off this tiredness. My eyes are heavy. I just want to sit by myself and enjoy my coffee before I go home to Hurricane Morgan. I stroll the paved sidewalk, crunching on colorful leaves. The slab of my Nikes echoes down the street. Autumn is always pretty in Silver Park. The birds chirp above my head as the trees sway. It's still a humid, sticky day, despite it being autumn. Magic has been used in the atmosphere so much it has changed the climate. Silver Park is quiet, and if you're not from uptown, you could mistake this for a suburb. But supernatural communities are far from a quiet suburb. What lurks beneath is deceptive, evil, and fights over territory. I arrive at the coffee shop and question if I have five dollars to spare. I don't, but I need the coffee. I freeze and take a sniff. Oh yes, caramel mocha. It reminds me of home, of Saturday morning when Dad and I walked to the cafe. I always got coffee with extra caramel. Dad liked his coffee black with no cream or sugar. The good old days when Dad was alive. I swing the glass door open and nearly hit a man leaving the diner. Excuse me, sir, I didn't see you standing there. It's okay, he says, stepping to the side. I stand at the register and wait for a host. The waitress parades past, her tail hanging underneath her dress. Is it safe to shift during the day in public? I've come to this diner my entire life. It's not a supernatural-only diner. I glance at the hostess coming in my direction, then back at the waitress, and her tail has disappeared. I rub my eyes. I'm tired. My mind is playing tricks. Table for one? The waitress asks, then pulls chapstick from her pocket and smears it across her lips before rubbing them together. I nod my head, yes. I'm not ashamed I came here alone. All the seats are full. The streets are quiet because everyone is here eating and gossiping. She leads me to a small booth near the back window. The window faces the parking lot. The sizzle of meat and eggs pierces the air. Despite that, I only have coffee on my mind. The waitress comes over to take my order. What can I get you? She hands me a menu. Her eyes are steel gray, her hair long and blonde. I give a dismissive wave. I don't need a menu. I know what I want. I glance over at her, and she has long ears to her shoulders. My eyes widen. This time, I'm not tripping. She keeps shifting. Maybe she has a disorder. She says nothing, but I'm sure she sees my facial expression. I can't hide my feelings. I'll take a large caramel mocha. Anything else? She asks while writing my order on a pad. No, that's all. I'll be right back. She slides the pencil behind her ear. The pad could fit behind her ear. She walks off, but her vanilla perfume lingers. I grab my phone from my purse and scroll my social media. A vibration shakes the salt and pepper shaker. Glaring across the table, a man sits with his hands folded, staring at me.
My eyes dance around and my heart flutters. Hello? This table is private. Chapter 3 If it's private, why did you call me? He leans forward and rests his elbow on the table. This fool has lost the little mind he has left. I didn't call anyone. He sits across from me with a sneer. He's watching me. But his hat is nearly covering his eyes. I wasn't sure what he's looking at. Is he hiding something? Call you? I didn't call you. I tilt my head to the side, a quick glance into his eyes showing him I'm serious. He takes off his hat, and I can view his eyes better. Mama says eyes are the window to the soul. And viewing his soul, I see he's not a bad guy or a snake. He doesn't appear to be sick. I can view sickness within the body. Even if the paranormal doesn't know they're sick, I do. He is supernatural. But what are his intentions with me? I have a sixth sense for supernaturals. I usually spot them in a crowd. Nine times out of ten, I'm right. You have a problem you need help with. Now I'm here. My name is Kato. He extends his hand. I hesitate, but I shake it. His golden skin is smooth and free from blemishes. I tap my hands on the table, intrigued by the handsome stranger who sits across from me. I'm not sure I trust him, but I realize I do need help. Can he rid my life of Prentice? The desire to be free of Prentice has been a burning seed in the pit of my belly. Here's your coffee, the waitress says while setting a cup on the table. Steam dances around the rim, the way I wanted it, piping hot. She turns and faces Cato. Can I get you something, sir? No, I didn't come to eat. He continues to keep his gaze on me, licking his thin pink lips. He must be trustworthy. Here goes nothing. I let out a sigh. I kind of need your help. I already feel my blood boiling, causing my temperature to rise. Every time Prentice comes to mind, I get heated. I have this collar around my neck. I lift my head to show the collar. Every time I take it off, I get sick and nearly pass out until I put the collar back on, then everything is fine. I take a gulp of my mocha. Okay. He stares at the silver collar slapped tight around my neck. There are no diamonds. It isn't sterling silver. It isn't jewelry. It might be a tracking device. Wait, there's more. I'm a healing witch, the only one in Michigan. I work for a slime ball, and I want to resign, but he won't let me. The warmth of rage consumes my face, my teeth clenching tight. Relax, Cato says. His voice is low and calming. I'm sure my aura came off as anger. My stomach balls into knots. I can help you. But there is a price you have to pay. He shrugs. I'm not paying him anything. I don't have any money, and I'm definitely not paying with my body. I didn't call him. He appeared saying he will help me. I give him a puzzled gaze, warning him not to fuck with me. His cheeks turn pink as he smiles, revealing two dimples, one deeper than the other. No, don't worry. I am not asking for any money. He sits straight and leans closer to the table. I'll need a vial of your blood. My mouth drops open and the hair on the back of my neck stands up. Blood? What are you, some kind of vampire? I cringe since most vampires are shady characters and sneaky. As soon as you become friends, they sneak in and bite. He chuckles. No, I am not a vampire. I'm a voodoo priest. He says it with such confidence. Not all voodoo priests are bad. Some practitioners take your blood and use them for evil things. I didn't believe they all practice black magic. The magic is the same. It's the practitioner who makes it dark. If you help me, I'll give my blood and anything else you ask for. 
my hand trembling, I grab my mocha and take a huge gulp. I'll help you now a bit to remove the collar. He pulls a small blade from his pocket and extends his hand out. It gets hotter in this diner, the temperature skyrocketing 20 degrees. A rolling band of sweat trickles down my face. It won't hurt, trust me. I lay my hand on the table as he grabs a small clear tube from his pocket. He nicks my arm and several drops of blood flow into the tube. There isn't any pain. He collects my blood in a matter of seconds. Wow, that was fast and painless. I wipe the sweat from my face, then glance at my arm. It's spotless, no marks or bruises. Now remove it, he tells me. Could I remove this collar without getting sick and nearly passing out? I take it off and set it on the table. I glare at the collar. Is it possible to not wear it ever again? The faintness hasn't kicked in yet. My vision is not blurry. Not having to wear this collar means I'm free. The world is huge, and I want to explore every inch of it. A heaviness pounds my chest. How could I leave Mama and my best friends, Morgan and Scott? Prentice is such an asshole, he might hurt them to get to me. I have to be strategic. Cato reaches in his pocket and pulls out a small brown bag. I'm not sure what he has up his sleeves, but I'm keeping my eye on him. There's a strong scent of garlic emanating from the bag. I lean back in the booth and turn my face toward the window. It's okay to focus on me. Relax. I glance his way. He pours brown dust resembling sand into his hand and blows the dust in my face. It doesn't hurt my eyes, but my vision clouds and I'm in another world. Forcing my eyes open, I expect Cato to be sitting across from me. He's not. Tell me who's there, Cato suggests. A girl with long, curly brown hair. She has freckles and wears a white dress. She could be a relative of mine. Her face round and pudgy, similar to Mama's. I don't get a glimpse of her eyes because she's staring at something. The universe moves in slow motion. I'm floating in a dream world. She has a grip around a knife in her right hand, covered in blood. My heart pulses in my throat. My breathing has increased. Did she hurt herself or someone else? What is it? A knife covered in blood. I continue viewing as a young boy sprints across the road. He has a dark jacket and one shoe. I notice the other shoe a few feet behind him in the street. He turns his head and glances at the lady, but keeps running. He doesn't appear injured, and there's no blood. But whatever he's running from scared the hell out of him. Charging toward me are two werewolves, less than five feet from me. Their eyes are green. One has blood stuck to his fur. I gasp and cover my mouth. The ground rattles under my feet. How the hell do I get out of this nightmare? The scent of rotten flesh invades my nostrils. I stumble back, getting the hell out of the way. Cato, they will kill me! I scream. The vision goes blank, and Cato is sitting in front of me, my entire shirt drenched in sweat. With trembling hands, I tap the table and run my hand across the booth. You're back here, in the cafe, in Detroit, Cato says. What did you see? I describe the boy and the lady and the bloody werewolves. Tears fill my eyes. Images of what happened to the lady and boy replay in my mind. Are the werewolves after them? I know I can't save them. Can I? I am sorry to tell you, but it seems as if you've been cursed. Cato collects the small bag and the vial of blood from the table. His voice is lower and more even. My mouth becomes dry as I tremble at the calmness in his voice. It's the sympathy voice. It's the same tone Mama had when she informed me of my father's grave condition. I understand I have a curse, but is this curse eternal? Was I stuck with Prentice forever? But I still have the collar off and I'm fine. I'll take your blood sample and do research. 
Maybe the curse is from the collar. If so, you have no reason to worry. He slides to the edge of the seat and stands. I'll be in touch. Wait, let me give you my address and phone number. He blushes. I'll find you. Chapter 4 Thunder, lightning, and raindrops hit the cement around me as I raced down the street. The sun was shining and the sky was clear before I went into the diner. I don't fear the rain. I love rain. It's the lightning that petrifies me. The rain is a constant reminder I need to make money so the rent gets paid this month. Or I'll be homeless, me and Morgan. It wouldn't be the first time I'd be homeless. Two years ago, I left my mother's home and found myself on the streets. I love my mother, but she's impossible to live with. I make it to my porch and let out a sigh. My hair is dripping wet and my cloth pants cling to my legs as I race up the stairs and into my apartment. What are you doing home this early? Morgan asks. I continue across the plush carpet, passing the blue leather sofa, to the bathroom. I grab a towel to dry my hair. I'm not trying to ignore Morgan, but I didn't want to soak the carpet. Morgan has an aunt who helped her get a high-paying job, and she doesn't make minimum wage. I do. It's been hard for me to make the rent for three months, but I've tried. As I continue down the hall, drying my hair, I debate if I should go into the living room and talk to her. I'm still tired from the healing this morning, and I don't want to hear Morgan complain. I continue into the front room and plop on the sofa. I wrap my hair in the bath towel. Morgan sits in the recliner watching the news. She veers her gaze my way. So? What? I lean back on the sofa and peer at the television, trying to avoid her puzzled eyes. Did you get fired? The question rolls off her tongue like syrup. She sits there with her arms folded, waiting for an answer. I've had trouble before quite often with the rent. She is within her rights to ask. Morgan gives it to you straight. No chaser. No, I didn't get fired. They summoned me to do a healing. A healing? You left work to do a free healing for Prentice? She quietly snarls, turning back to me to give me an intense glare. Her slender face is now even longer. I shrug. I'm not enthused. What did she want me to do? It was an injured supernatural. Morgan's all human. Even though she knows about the contract, she doesn't completely understand the supernatural world. She once told me to just rip the contract to shreds or take Prentice to court. Harmony? Her voice now raised. If you are going to leave work and do a healing, Prentice needs to pay you. He pays everybody else. We have bills around here. Wrinkles appear across her forehead. I roll my eyes. I know we have bills, including rent, and I will have the rent next week. She lets out a huff. The same shit every other month. Morgan, let it go. I said I will have the rent. How patient are they going to be before they fire you? She rolls her eyes and turns in the direction of the television. I'm guessing she's done with her lecture. A knock on the door echoes from the hall and is delightful to hear. Maybe this will shut Morgan's mouth temporarily. Morgan rises to her feet and slaps a rubber band around her long black hair. She goes to the door and swings it open. I notice the black shoes before his face appears. Scott is my other best friend. He loves Nikes, too. We all have been friends since middle school. He doesn't come over much since he started dating Bethany. A grin blessed my face at the sight of Scott's tall, stocky frame. But he had a serious expression on his face. I can sense there is a problem. What's wrong? I ask. His blue eyes dart around the room. Then he takes a seat on the couch next to me. Morgan hovers nearby, anticipating something vital rolling off his tongue. I was at the library today and read an article in an old book regarding a girl who was cursed by vampires, and the only way she breaks the curse is by letting them bite her. His eyes got wider and danced back and forth between me and Morgan. No, no, no. I sit up on the couch. I've tried telling Morgan, but she has an attitude. Telling me what? 
Morgan says, then takes a seat on the recliner. I met this man today, Cato. He told me I'm cursed, which is not news, but he stated it could be from the collar. I lift my chin to show them the collar is off. I haven't been sick since I took it off. Where is it? Morgan asks. In my purse. He also blew some dust in my face and I saw a vision. I hate reliving the scary vision. It will freak Morgan out, but it happened. A vision of what? She moves closer to the edge of the chair. A lady from years ago with a bloody knife in her hand. As I tremble, I recount the events. Who is this Cato? Scott asked. He's a nice guy. A voodoo priest. A voodoo priest? They both ask with their mouths and eyes wide open. Yes, a voodoo priest. I know why they're concerned, but not every voodoo priest is bad. And I know Cato is safe. But by the expressions on their faces, you would think I said a serial killer. Scott's face contorts in a frown. His rough glare would have sent shivers through me if I were afraid of him. Did you give him any of your blood? Scott asks. Yes, he's going to run some tests. Listen, I trust him. It's my way of trying to soothe Scott. I hate when he's angry. Your collar is off. Make an escape. Morgan prods. It's already crossed my mind, but I've thought of Mama. I'd have to leave her behind. She's afraid to leave the house. Maybe I can convince her. A sudden sadness comes over me. Leaving my friends is devastating. Scott and Morgan are family to me. Blinking back tears, I glare over at Morgan. My muscles tense. I take a hard swallow of pain. It's okay, Morgan. Your life is worth more than anything. I'll be fine. She rises to her feet and walks to me with her hands extended. I leap from the couch and hug her. She is my best friend and was there for me when no one else was. More than anything, I know both of them love me unconditionally. Scott appears visibly mad, his face flushed with anger. I know Scott has romantic feelings for me. In high school, I entertained going out with him. I got scared, not wanting to ruin our friendship. Then, Bethany came into the picture, killing any romantic chances we had. But I must admit, he is handsome, with nice, slick blonde hair and a sleeve of tattoos on his left arm. He even got my name tattooed on him in Chinese letters. I went with him to get it. He told me when Bethany asked what it meant, he said harmony, like peace. I second that, Harmony. You should get away from here. If it will make you happier, I'm all for that, Scott says. I have something to tell you both, Scott announces to us both. He takes three guilty steps back. He bites his lip and stares at the floor. He's nervous at something stupid. I fix him with a stare. Bethany is pregnant. Pregnant? I'm in shock. My hands shake. She barely lets him outside now, and with a baby, he will be Bethany's prisoner. I'm trying to forget the words flying out of his mouth. Morgan does her happy dance. Congratulations, Scott! Aren't you happy for me, Harmony? Yep. I let out a sigh. Are you happy about this? I ask. Yeah. He nods his head. I'm going to be a father. Hell no, I'm not happy. Scott is barely 20. He knows nothing in regards to being a father. Bethany has been trying to get her claws in him for years. She's a shifter from night heights. I'm not sure why Scott even got involved with her. She's been involved with several other paranormals within the last year. I wanted me and Scott to be together one day, but it's not going to happen. I'm emotional. Everything is happening simultaneously. I'm free. I'm moving. Scott's having a baby. And I might have to leave my mother behind. I give Scott a hug. Congratulations. I'll go pack now. Scott pins me with his gaze. I'm trapped in his eyes. Trying to hide my emotions. I'm not happy for him at all. And he knows. 
I race out of the room, fighting back tears. Chapter 5 I stuff my clothes in a suitcase, then slam it shut. I don't want to leave, but Scott and Morgan insist. I scrape together my life savings of $478. I have an aunt in New Orleans, and I'm sure she'll let me stay with her. All I need is a Greyhound ticket and to convince Mama to come. I grab my bag and shuffle to the front door. Morgan and Scott are both sitting on the couch. A panicked expression clouds Morgan's face. She's always been vocal. A heavy exhalation escapes my lips as I scan the living room for more of my possessions. Your tattoo is getting larger. I have a creepy feeling, Morgan says, shaking her head while staring at my neck. I'm curious, but the tattoo isn't hurting me. Morgan hands me a mirror. Look at how large it's gotten. I grab the mirror to view the tattoo. I flick my long blonde hair over my shoulder and glare at my reflection in the mirror. The tattoo is rough, staring back at me. I run my finger across the warm, scaly texture. My God, it has gotten larger since this morning. Is this a sign? I've had the tattoo since my adolescent years. It's mandatory. Get out of town and stop performing the healings, Morgan says. Seems like they're related. I hope not. My flat tone has Scott trembling. He wasn't paying much attention to Morgan. All eyes are on me. His glowing green eyes had taken over, and for a second, I forgot my circumstances. I'm not sure, but it might, Scott says and takes a huge swig of water. I'm freaked out, and there's no time to waste. There are rumors about a girl who tried escaping, never to be seen again. I don't want my face plastered across a milk carton. You have to consider yourself, Scott says. He always has my best interest at heart, and I have no reason to believe he doesn't now. I grab him and give him a bear hug. I sniffle and let him go, wiping my tears. This is not goodbye. I'll see you later, Scott says. As I stand in front of Mama's building, I cringe in disgust. She doesn't own the building, but she has lived there longer than I can remember. She lives in a rundown flat she should be happy to leave, but she won't. Her stress, bipolar, and anxiety are terrible. She never leaves. She orders everything off television, Amazon, and groceries from Peapod. She has gotten comfortable in the house and wants me to stay inside with her. She thinks someone is always out to kill us both. Right now, I have one shot to convince her to come with me. I bang on the door and get a whiff of fried chicken. Sheesh, I'm hungry. My stomach growls. I need a home-cooked meal. Hey, Harmony! Her brown eyes twinkle and she giggles. Her laugh is infectious. I'm her only child. She is overbearing, but there is nothing she wouldn't do for me. Why do you have your suitcase? Are you moving in? She asks. I continue into the house, closing the door behind me. No, Mama, but I'm hungry. You're right on time for dinner. I pass the large red sofa as the sun shines through the cracks of the zebra print curtains. Mama has a plain Jane sense of fashion, so I helped her decorate. I enter the dining room and rest my suitcase against the wooden china cabinet. Viewing the dozens of pictures on the wall gives me great sadness. Pictures of Dad and me when I was a child. I miss him so much. The peach-colored walls, the aroma of fried chicken, and homemade mashed potatoes all tell me I'm home. Mama walks in the dining room, carrying a plate of food. She puts the plate in front of me, and I dig in like it's my last meal. I don't have much money, and I haven't had Mama's chicken in a long time. I fill my belly until my pants are too tight. Morgan doesn't cook, and neither do I. We eat quick foods, something to pop in the microwave, or Burger King, and I'm sick of burgers. How is Morgan doing? She's fine, Mama, working hard. I'm glad you're here. I haven't seen you in a while. She extends her hand out, and I put my hand in hers. No, what are you doing? 
Her trembling hands grip mine tight. Mama, what's wrong? Her face becomes pale and the dark circles around her eyes become exaggerated. She appears to have seen a ghost. But she's having a conversation with someone. My heart flutters, but I stay calm. She has visions. Mama, what do you see? I'm concerned because Mama appears more terrified than usual. A young lady. She is hurt, and there is blood everywhere. She eases her grip on my hand and covers her mouth. Please, someone help! She screams. Her visions, the anxiety, have taken a toll on our relationship. However, she is my mother, and I love her no matter what. Doctors told me not to feed into her visions. They aren't real. But they are real to Mama, and I can't blow her off. A young boy, running, with dark hair. He's missing a shoe. The fear in her voice sends a ball of pain shooting through my stomach, like a star in the middle of the night. The boy from my vision earlier. I want to talk to him. What happened? Why is he running? I inch over and kneel until we face each other. She looks past me, tears filled her eyes. I wrap my arms around her as she tries pulling away from my thin limbs, but I pull her in close. Stay calm, Mama, I whisper. Her posture relaxes, but fear still dances across her face. The more I view her face, the weaker the veil appears. The vision is clear. Mama, I see him. Can he hear us? The thump of my heartbeat is loud and rapid. Mama had plenty of visions before, but I'd never been able to view them. She is not crazy. The visions are real. No, but if you have a glimpse of him, the veil between the living and the dead world is getting weaker. Mama cringes, her eyes widen, her face flushed with fear. The wolves, they're chasing him, she gasps. I lose the vision of the young boy, but Mama is stuck in the illusion. I tried quieting her screams once her anxiety had taken over. I'm not sure if she could hear me. But then a loud bang came from the door. Mama put her hand over her mouth, muffling her screams. Now she's terrified, glaring at the door. It's okay. I turn to answer the door when Mama grabs my arm. I dart my gaze back to Mama, the hopelessness showing in her face. Her expression says danger is lurking, but she doesn't say a word. I pry my arm away from her death grip and race to the door. I assume it's the neighbors, concerned because of the screaming. Without asking for a name, I open the door. And Prentice stands there with a snarl. His bulky arms folded, his stance defensive. I back away from the door as he makes his way farther into my house. He glances over at Mama and waves. Her breathing becomes more labored and she grimaces as if she's in pain. The pain is the sight of him. She doesn't know Prentice, but she knows danger. It's rude not to offer me a seat. He slams the door behind him and takes a seat on the sofa. What the hell is he doing here? And furthermore, how did he know where my mother lives? He knows everyone in the neighborhood. I'm sure he asked. He has a lot of nerve coming to my mother's house unannounced. What are you doing here? I clench my teeth. Blood shoots fast through my veins to my brain. Everything's red. My mother is not involved in this, so leave her out of it. I came to check on you. Where's the collar? He crosses his legs. I stand there in silence. There must be a tracking device in this damned collar. Anger flits across his face as he waits for an answer. He shakes his head as his eyes buck. Let me make this clear. If you leave, everything you love will be destroyed. The paranoia your mother has will be catastrophic. Morgan, she is a fine little thing, and I'm sure I could get a lot of money for her. If you touch my family, he bolts off the couch, you will do what? He stands within an inch of me. My heart thunders inside my chest. I back away from him, hitting the wall. He eyes me, holding onto his waist. Oh yeah, Scott will never meet his baby. If you're willing to sacrifice everything for your freedom, leave. I hate ever getting myself in this situation. 
I'm suffocating with no way out. All my concentration is on Mama, her safety, her sanity. Hallucinating, my spirit is leaving my body. They will be better without me. I could rid myself of this curse and guarantee safety for my family. He glares at Mama, who is in full freakout mode. She is gasping and wheezing like an asthmatic patient in need of an inhaler. He smiles at Mama, fangs bared. Her eyes shoot wide open, bloodshot red. How much are you willing to pay to be free? Chapter 6 I scan my keychain, locating my pink house key. The sound of rap music blasts in the background. I know Morgan is still home. She'll be shocked when she sees I'm still here. I'm not going to run away. I refuse to let Prentice win. The distant scent of chocolate floats from the kitchen. Music blares, and I don't want to sneak up on Morgan. I go farther into the kitchen and view Morgan dancing while stirring brownie mix in a large bowl. Morgan couldn't buy rhythm, but she continues to dance. Her multicolored socks glide across the floor as she shakes her ass while I bust out laughing and cut the radio off. She's swift to turn, and at the sight of me, she drops the spoon to the floor. Her eyes bulge, large as saucers. She stutters. Didn't you escape? What are you doing here? I plop in a chair, sliding my suitcase on the floor. I'd toted the suitcase enough today. My eyes are heavy and my hands sore. I yawn and stretch my hands, then rest my elbow on the wooden kitchen table. I'm not going. I'm staying here with my friends and Mama. What, Harmony? Is this a joke? We agreed it's best. Are you going to risk your life? Snarling, she grabs another spoon from the drawer and continues beating the brownie mix. I have to find another way, Morgan. I don't want to argue. I'm sleepy. I want to run away from my racing thoughts of Prentice hurting me or my family. I want to tell her everything he said, but I can't bring myself to. I went to Mama's, and Prentice showed up. She stops stirring the brownies and rests the bowl on the counter. What did he say? She mutters, her hands balling into fists. He said he knows I took off the collar and not to try to leave. She slams her fist into the countertop. Damn it, he can't control your life. We have to stop him. She shoots me a look. What do you want to do? This is the first time she's asked me what I wanted. She means well, but she can be controlling. Scott and Morgan say it's a good idea for me to leave. I'm not sure it's the best decision for me. I built my life in Detroit. Mama is here. I want to be liberated, but Prentice has control over me. What are your options? Going to the police? She raised a perfectly arched eyebrow in my direction. She knows that's not a real option. What a joke. I roll my eyes. He has the police under a spell. Even police officers presume Prentice is a wonderful person, and he loves Silver Park. Prentice gives out food and clothes to the supernaturals in need. This is all part of his mask. All his activities are illegal, but no one notices. Everyone turns a blind eye. I bite my bottom lip out of frustration at not being able to do anything. I'm imprisoned, and at Prentice's beck and call. He summons me whenever he needs. Even in the middle of the night, it doesn't matter. Morgan grabs a pan from the cupboard and fills it with brownie batter before sliding it in the oven. You can keep working for him until you save more money, then vanish in the middle of the night, Morgan suggests. I sigh and shrug. None of these ideas sound good, and neither helps me get my freedom. Maybe you're right. We do need another plan. But I'm concerned. She shakes her head and points to my tattoo. Why? She takes a seat at the table, then grabs her box of cigarettes. Harmony, I'm serious. She grabs a lighter and lights a cigarette. Something about that tattoo is not right. She takes a puff, then tilts her head back and blows the smoke to the ceiling. 
In the past, I've seen professionals regarding this tattoo. The shaman told me it's nothing alarming. I rest my head on my hand. I'm relieved Morgan stopped speaking about my options, considering it's hopeless. I reposition myself in the chair as my eyes widen. I have a great idea. Know who will help? With ideas and options on getting my freedom? Who? Morgan asks. Cato. She shoots a death stare at me, exhales, and puts her cigarette in the ashtray. The crazy voodoo priest? Her face wrinkles in distaste. I put my hand on my forehead. He's not crazy, maybe different, but not crazy. He is cute to me. Maybe weird because he did voodoo, but hell, I'm a witch. He had the cutest smile and a nice smell. Whenever he came to mind, I relaxed. It's not safe to talk to him, but if you really think he can help, then I'm on board. I press my lips together, holding back the words I want to blurt out. It's not her decision, and I don't need her to be on board. I want to scream, I don't give a damn what you say, I'm going to meet him anyway. The main goal, take down Prentice. Then I reclaim my life. If we don't succeed at beating Prentice, that blood-sucking vampire won't let you out of his bite easily. The smell of chocolate curls underneath the cracks in the oven. My mouth waters, thinking about the enormous portion I'm about to eat. True, but if I rid myself of this curse, he would have no use for me. Morgan's face turns bright red as a beat. Her eyes dance around the room. She grabs her glass, lifting it in the air. Cheers! I don't believe there's anything we can do. That's where Cato comes in. Plan A, take down Prentice. Plan B, rid myself of the curse. Chapter 7 The next morning, I want to see Cato. I have tons of questions for him. How will this work? Yeah, I want to get rid of the curse and Prentice, but I don't want him to endure any extreme pain. I don't want Cato to make any voodoo dolls of anyone. I just want him to go far away. Somewhere cold. Alaska, perhaps. I leave the apartment and head toward the cafe where I met Cato. Maybe he hangs out there. The birds chirp above my head, so I pick up the pace. I had a bird shit on my head once before, and it wasn't a good experience. The last time Cato appeared, stating that I called him. The unfortunate side of being an untrained witch is I don't know how to use my magic. That makes it easier to be a target and be taken advantage of. I know I can heal and see sickness with supernaturals, but Dad told me before he died there is far more to my magic than healing. I just have to tap into all my magic. He was going to start training on my 16th birthday, but he died when I was 13, so I never got trained. Cato? Cato? My intention is to contact Cato somehow. He said he'd find me when he knew something, but I can't wait. I need to see him now. My shoes scrape against the gravel as I stomp down the street. My footsteps are loud. It's almost as if someone traveled alongside me. I cut my eyes left, and Cato is there, wearing a big grin on his face, showing his white teeth. I giggle because I'm nervous. He wears neon colors and mismatched shoes. Like a genie in a bottle, he appears out of thin air. How do you do that? He shrugs, standing far enough away I can't feel the essence of his presence. I'm blessed with the magic of appearing, he explains. So, where were you going when you called me? Snooping for you. Want to go to the ice cream parlor? Cato asked. Sure. It's hot and muggy outside. Ice cream is needed to cool off. I brush my blonde locks behind my ear. Supernaturals love ice cream. At least the dragons do. I always thought it cooled their breath. The ice cream parlor is in Night Heights. 62 flavors, and they have the best custard. I try my hardest not to be mesmerized by Cato's sexy bedroom eyes. This is business. He's going to help me get rid of the curse. 
but his smooth skin and muscular build are making this hard. By the time we get to the 60s-themed parlor, I'm nearly melting from the humidity. There's a jukebox in the corner, playing rock and roll, and several miniature statues of guys with slick hair holding guitars. I catch a whiff of the baked cookies. The scent gets stronger until I have to order one. I'm trying to watch my figure, but what the hell. The cookies won't hurt too much. We get to the counter to order ice cream, and Cato orders black walnut. Who the hell orders black walnut? I order a rocky road and my cookies. We gather our scoops of ice cream and find a booth. The parlor is half full, unusual for the summer months. Usually teenagers hang out here. They overcrowd the place and leave no seats available. Not today. I take a lick of the lumpy textured chocolate flavored ice cream and close my eyes. I want to scream this ice cream is so good. The excitement must show upon my face. You love Rocky Road, I see, Cato says. I smile and wipe the excess ice cream from my face. Yeah, I do. Two guys trot past our table and scrunch their noses, showing obvious distaste. Cato sticks out like a sore thumb in night heights. He dresses weird, but he has a great heart. I notice it, but I don't care. I haven't gotten dirty stares since high school. Have you thought about this? What? I spoon more ice cream and shove it in my mouth. I haven't had Rocky Road in years. If you can't do magic, who are you? People admire you because you heal the sick. His question holds my heart hostage. I lean back and scratch my head. I'm Harmony, but being able to heal has been a part of my identity for the last couple of years, since I found out I was a witch. Are you sure you want this? He grabs a spoonful of ice cream. He holds the spoon in his hand, waiting for a response. I'm certain I want freedom from this curse, but who will I be? Harmony with the same goals, just not able to heal anymore. Goals of a better job and being completely independent. My life would be better. Is the caller the reason you're stuck with Prentice? Or something else? It's the only thing holding me to Prentice. You believe I'd associate myself with him if he didn't have this curse hanging over my head? He looks around to make sure no one is within earshot. I want you to consider every aspect. I believe your curse is a key component to who you really are. His tone rough and stern. I wasn't scared, but shocked. I'm sure I want this. Freedom is near. I can smell and taste it. I'll take the chance. Okay. He exhales. I'll put a curse on you. You can no longer heal anyone. All of your magic will cease. What is he talking about? The only magic I have is healing. I'm fine with another magic stopping because there is no other. If, after a few trial days, you are sure this is what you want, I will do everything in my power to rid you of this curse. But if you aren't, I will do everything in my power to help you uproot Prentice in an effort to make you and your family safe. Chapter 8 Pushing myself to keep my eyes open, I grab the basket full of fries from the oil. I empty the fries in the warmer and scan the room to make sure no one's watching. I grab my cup of coffee from the counter and take a gulp. I don't know why they make the coffee so damn hot. I like mine piping hot, but not scorching. Someone could burn their tongue. I put the small cup of coffee back on the shelf underneath the register. Management hates it when you eat or drink on the clock. The heat from the fryer brought a raging sweat across my face. My legs are throbbing in pain from standing on them for hours. I had a long night. I let out an aggravated huff, not sure I'll make it through this shift. I'm fatigued. I get back to the register and hand the brunette her food. But the weird thing is, I can't read her. I don't understand what she's thinking. I don't know if she's sick internally. A jigsaw puzzle I can't put together. I can't feel her energy. 
I never realized how much energy I got from supernaturals. The world is dull and fuzzy. Harmony, snap out of it. Shayna snaps her fingers in front of my face. I'm caught in a daydream or nap. I shake my head and yawn. Did you have a long night? Get to work before Terry catches you, Shayna pleads. I glance at Shayna and nod. Shayna is human and nice. I can't tell what she's thinking either. Her uniform shirt is dingy. I can't even read her facial expression. Everything is washed out. Shayna and I have been co-workers for months now. She's always had my back. She's a single mother and works all the overtime she can. Does everybody see what I see? I rub my eyes and glare at my next customer. He has on the largest cowboy hat I've ever seen. I couldn't tell if he's human or supernatural. I used to have a sixth sense for this. The smell of cheap cologne floats through the air, and I know Terry will turn the corner any minute. He piles the cologne on heavy. He's trying to find a wife at Burger King, I guess. Fifty with no kids or wife. What a dull life. If he weren't such a tight ass, maybe he wouldn't be single. Terry creeps past my register as I take the order of the man in the big hat. The customer grimaces, and I can't tell if he is in pain or deciding what he wants to order. My sixth sense is worse than I thought. I'll take a large Coke, he says, reaching into his pocket, pulling out a brown wallet. I twist around to get the Coke, then slip and land flat on my ass. Who the hell mopped the floor in the middle of the day? A sharp pain kicks in. I'm tired. I could lie here and go to sleep. Shayna comes over and extends her hand. Harmony, are you okay? I watch her shoulders sink and a grim expression of concern crosses her eyes. I hop to my feet and see the yellow caution sign. I swear it wasn't there before. I'm fine. I didn't need any help, though I shook with embarrassment. Before I could finish making the coke, Terry is calling my name. He wants me to fill out an incident report, but it's not a big deal. It's a little bump. I hesitate before going to Terry's office. I don't want a lecture. As I head down the hall, I try to come up with an excuse. I will tell the truth. I didn't know the floor was wet. Terry is the safety police, always insisting everyone wears a hairnet, skid-resistant shoes, and gloves. Tapping on the door makes my knees buckle. Here goes nothing. Come on in, it's open. Twisting the knob, I think about running out of the back door. I'm too tired for bullshit today. Before you go on your tangent, I didn't know the floor was wet. I stand next to his desk with my hand resting on my hip. No, Harmony, have a seat. He closes his laptop, then takes off his glasses. He looked serious. This is more than filling out the incident form. The room gets smaller and warmer. I fidget with my hands and take a seat in the chair in front of his desk. He lets out a sigh and rubs his eyes. This is worse than I thought. What could be this bad? Harmony, it saddens me to say this. He wipes the sweat from his brow. I tap my foot on the floor. Say what? My bottom lip quivers. My heart has stopped. Is he going to fire me? Can't be. You have been distracted at work, leaving in the middle of your shifts, and let's not count the number of times you've been late. He darts his gaze toward the wall. He can't look at me. Although all those things are true, I do my job. Terry, are you serious? My blood is boiling. He eyeballs me. Harmony, you're a good worker. He clears his throat. When you are here and not distracted. But lately, I, I don't know what's going on with you. Are you having problems at home? No, Terry, I can do my job. My eyes widen as the heat rises in my cranium. One of my vessels will pop any minute. I need this job. I have bills to pay. I will give you one more chance, Harmony. He narrows his brown eyes on mine. One more screw up, and you are out of here. 
Consider yourself warned. Fighting back tears, I nod my head. Thank you. I exhale after holding my breath for what seems like an eternity. I slide the chair back and scurry out of his office. I stand in the hall and take a deep breath as the tightness in my chest decreases. That was a close one. I gawk in sheer horror, watching Family Feud as one player gives the dumbest answer. If I were a contestant on Family Feud, I'd win. I know the answers, but I don't have enough family for the show. I lay on the couch with my feet propped up. The heels of my feet hurt almost as much as my ass. My plan is to relax tonight. I'm home alone, so it's peace and quiet. The doorbell rings. Damn, who the hell is that? Morgan has a key. I'm going to lie here and pretend no one is home. Bam, bam. Now the asshole knocks at the door? My grip around the remote control tightens as I try to remind myself that whoever is at the door is here for Morgan, and she is not home. I'm coming. I sigh and rise to my feet. Passing the four-foot-tall plant in the corner makes me sneeze. It's Morgan's houseplant she refuses to get rid of. I unlock the door prepared to say Morgan's not here, but it's Scott, with a contorted face. I couldn't tell if he is happy or sad, but he is fidgety, tugging at his sleeves. He slips past me and takes a seat in Morgan's recliner. Come on in, Scott. I snicker sarcastically. So much for my quiet evening. I take a seat back on the couch and slide the remote control on the coffee table. Where's Morgan? He says. She has not come home yet. Scott takes off his black jacket and lets the recliner back. Can you believe I'm going to be a dad? Oh, that's why the panic is on his face. I get to my feet and head for the kitchen. Do you want some wine? Yeah. I grab the pink Moscato and two glasses and walk back to the living room. I hand Scott a glass. Yes, I can believe it. Are you ready? He grabs the bottle of wine and pours until the glass is full. He takes a large gulp. Eight weeks. He sits the glass on the table and lets out a loud burp. Eight weeks is right around the corner. I know it scares him, but I have to figure out a way to ask if he's sure this baby is his. She got pregnant rather quick, and I don't trust her. Sure, Scott has had his indiscretions, but he isn't pregnant. The light from the television highlights his handsome features. His cheeks flushed with joy when he spoke of fatherhood. I slide back on the couch and cross my legs. It made my stomach hurt thinking of the question I would ask, but I need to know. Besides, he should at least be curious. You remember when you and Bethany broke up? Yeah, why? He lowers the footrest on the recliner and darts his gaze to me. His forehead is wrinkled and his tone more serious. It's a rumor. She was with Josh. I squint my eyes. I didn't want to see the rage on his face. Which Josh? Shifter? From the wolf pack? Yeah, he's the one. He doesn't act surprised or bothered. Maybe it's not news to him? He might have put this in the past and moved on. I hope I didn't open a wound. He waves dismissively. It was months ago, and she said nothing happened between the two of them, and I believe her. I put my hands in the air. I mentioned it. I take another gulp of my wine. I'm glad it's off my chest. I need to commit to Bethany. We're expecting a child soon. You know, Harmony, I got a good feeling. What do you mean? You ready for marriage? Um, maybe. Hitting me like a thousand knives, the air is sucked out of my lungs. Marriage? Is he fucking serious? They're having a baby doesn't mean they need to take vows. My jaw trembles in fury. I'm going to need something stronger than wine. He comes and sits next to me on the sofa. We are going in different directions in life, but everything will be fine, he explains. 
Congratulations, Scott. I'm... I'm happy for you. I give him a bear hug. I close my eyes and aim for his jaw, but my lips landed on his. They are thin and smooth and my tongue is all over his mouth. He doesn't stop and neither do I. It was my first real kiss and I never imagined it would be like this. It's an explosion of fireworks all happening at one time. This is so wrong on so many levels. He's my best friend and he's having a baby. But why does it feel so damn good? I pull back. It's time you go home. He stares in my eyes. I gotta go. He pats his pocket and retrieves his phone. We wait for his Uber to come in in complete silence. I trail behind him to the door. I don't want to say goodbye. But I know it's better to keep some distance. He was just on the couch saying he might want to marry Bethany. He shuffles out the door and swivels around before leaving. No matter what, I will always love you, Harmony. Chapter 9 The sizzle of butter and cinnamon dances across the skillet as I prepare breakfast. I'm slaving over a hot stove making French toast, my favorite, for me and Morgan. My vision is fuzzy, but my sense of smell is perfect. One of the best things about cooking breakfast is the sweet scent. I overhear Morgan mumbling, the pitter-patter of her footsteps slapping against the floor. Harmony, she calls. I'm engrossed in cooking. I can't stop. If I take my eyes off the food for a minute, it will burn. And I don't want crisp French toast. Hey, I was calling you, Morgan says. Yeah, what did you want? I grab the spatula and flip the toast on the other side. What are you making? She peeks over my shoulder, viewing the skillet. What do you see? French toast, a nice golden brown. She rubs her hands together. You're making me some, right? Sure. Working at Burger King has its perks. When making French toast, you mix the cinnamon and butter together, then coat the grill. Morgan loves my breakfast. It's the only meal I make. And Morgan can't cook anything. I grab the handle of the skillet with a dish rag, which creates a searing sound. I quickly put the skillet in the sink and spray water, creating steam throughout the kitchen. The steam doesn't bother Morgan, maybe because she smokes cigarettes. My eyes water and I cough. Damn, it's smoky in here. I open the kitchen window above the sink to let the smoke escape. Once the smoke is clear, I take a seat next to Morgan at the kitchen table. Reading the morning newspaper without a worry is her thing. She lowers the newspaper to the table and grabs a piece of French toast. A red bandana tied around her hair matches the ripped pajama pants that cling to her wide hips. It's a lazy Saturday morning. Her crazed eyes circle my face. You have a sort of glow this morning. What happened? I grimace and shake my head. Nothing. I can't let her know I kissed Scott last night. She would have a heart attack. She smells the lie, but I won't break. Something is definitely different. She keeps chewing with her mouth open like a cow. Yeah, something is different. I love Scott. But the best thing for me and Scott is if we keep this kiss our little secret. I'm not scared Morgan will tell anyone. It's that she is so damn opinionated. Okay, there's one thing different. I swallow a piece of bacon and take a gulp of milk. Morgan shoots a stare my way. She has a smug expression. I can read her expression this morning, but I don't have any idea what's in her head. The curse has been reversed, sort of. Her face goes from excited to confused. What do you mean, sort of? I can't heal anymore, but with the new curse, I can't read thoughts, and the world is not as vivid. Listening to myself say those words makes me realize it's a catch-22. But if it gets Prentice out of my life, I'm okay with it. Does it have any other side effects? Morgan asks. I don't know. She rolls her eyes and turns her nose up. Her face turns as pink as the wallpaper. Why didn't you ask? 
Stop letting people do things to your body, and you know nothing about side effects. Her hands ball into fists. I understand what she is saying, but she always thinks the worst. Let me guess. Your voodoo priest friend reversed the curse? Her eyes flash. Yeah, but the main goal is to get away from Prentice, and he won't need me if I can't heal. I move my plate to the side and cover my face with my hands. Morgan ruined my appetite. This quiet Saturday morning turned into a nightmare. Have you ever considered maybe there are no side effects? My heart now races, my blood lukewarm. Be careful. She smacks her lips. I didn't realize he was a vampire at first. I take a deep breath and smile at the tall, clean-shaven gentleman who stands in front of my register. He's wearing a long, dingy flannel shirt, inappropriate clothing for a hot day. Welcome to Burger King. How can I help you? You can come with me. Prentice needs you now, he says. Again, Prentice is sending creeps to my job, demanding I come to his location. Who the hell is he in charge of? Not me anymore. His obsession with me is becoming offensive. Listen, I need to finish my shift. Tell Prentice I'll stop by when I get off. Prentice is in for a rude awakening. He smiles, showing his fangs. You need to come now. He slips his hands in his pocket. My eyes widen and I get closer in his face, my lips tight. I'll get there when I can. Arching an eyebrow in his direction, my voice is low but stern. I don't want my co-workers or Terry to witness me scream. He nods. I'll tell him. He stomps away from my register and out the door. Prentice's workers are always trying to intimidate me. I can't heal, so there's no need for me to be afraid anymore. There's solace in freedom. Something I've not experienced in the past two years but I'm determined to be free now. The customer flow is slow. I wipe the counters and wait on my next customer. I only have one hour left of this shift, and the bed is calling my name. Since I haven't done any healings, I'm not drained. I am tired, but not falling over tired. As soon as I inhale the odor of day-old blood, I had the urge to run. I glare at the lobby as Prentice strolls toward my register. No need for me to be afraid. I will get this settled once and for all. What's the problem? He says. There is no problem. Terry steps to my register. If your friend is going to stand here, he needs to order something. And continues walking to the grill area. You heard the man. I twist my lips into a frown. Give me a milkshake. What's with the fucking attitude? He slams three dollars on the counter. Stop sending people here. I lower my voice and scan the room. I need my job and have a ton of bills. I roll my eyes and walk off to get the milkshake. He snatches the cup from my hand. Is that the problem? You want a check? I can get you on the payroll. I don't want to work for him anymore. I want to help my people, but I have to do it for myself. No, that's not it. I can't heal anymore. It feels good to say those words, and a warmth fills my chest. I'm a little nervous he might attempt to hurt me. With a puzzled look, he says, What? I stare at him and shrug. Since the collar came off, my healing abilities no longer work. Might as well lie. Cato is none of his business. Another customer steps in line behind Prentice. I move to the side and tell the customer I'll help her at the next register. I leave Prentice standing there, his eyes now red as he clenches his teeth. The vein in his neck is bulging. He's going to explode any minute. The customer grabs her food and walks off. Then Prentice steps over. How's that even possible? He beats his fist on the counter. Maybe it's from you forcing me to do these healings, and now they don't work. And now I'm free from his crazy ass. 
Maybe I should put the collar back on. He shakes his head. That's the problem. I don't have the collar anymore. I lost it. And it's not going to help. My healing powers are gone. It's liberating. The shackles have dropped to the floor. The crack in his voice and disappointment on his face is priceless. He's a control freak. He gets a kick out of controlling me, but it's done. This isn't over. I'll fix this. Don't dream of leaving. He walks out the door and I giggle. He thinks he still has the upper hand, but he doesn't. I do. I trot to the bathroom with my spirits lifted, knowing I have taken a little of my freedom back. I run my hands under the warm water and glance over at the mirror. I push the locks of my blonde hair to the side. I see the angry tattoo staring back at me. What does this mean? It's getting larger and larger. Poking my finger at the tattoo, I get a warm sensation. Is my magic associated with this tattoo? I've had it for a while, but it's always been small. Now it's taken on a life of its own. I have to seek help before it's too late. Chapter 10 I storm out, a ball of emotions. Excited, I let Prentice know I can't heal anymore, and nervous this tattoo is creeping along my neck toward my face. It's something, considering the temporary lift of the curse. The tattoo has spiraled out of control, and I'm not sure if it's dangerous. Cato! I yell as I continue trotting down the street, expecting him to show any minute now. The last time I called him, he appeared at my side within two minutes. I pause and scan the scenery. Soon, Cato will pop out like a jack-in-the-box. As my stomach rumbles, I grab a pack of cookies from my purse. Realizing I've been standing here for five minutes, it's clear Cato is not coming. I have an idea. There's a small, sketchy part of town, Burnt Ridge, a community of outcast supernaturals. A lot of dark dealing happens in that area. Maybe Cato hangs out there. The night sky's a gloomy, dusty gray. Arriving at Burnt Ridge makes fear skate through my body. There is a parade of people walking along the dead-end street. Supernaturals fill the couches laying around on the street. They walk around carefree, waving and smiling. I don't come to this part of town often, but most supernaturals know me because I do healings. Would they lose respect for me if they found out I can't perform healings anymore? Performing healings is part of my identity. Everyone knows Harmony the Healer. The odorous smell of funk and fire swarms through the air. I walk past three booths and come upon the last booth where Cato sits. I freeze and stare. He's holding the hands of a woman. She has red hair that flows as the wind blows, a stream of tears caressing her cheeks. Cato continues talking to her. I'm not sure what he's saying, but the woman appears devastated. Cato peers my way, and his eyes pop at the sight of me. I stand there in pure shock, my legs heavy. I want to scurry away, but I can't. What is he telling her? Does he perform dark magic? A man wearing a sheet around his body, only exposing his face, walks past me. He never makes eye contact, looking straight ahead. His face is as blank as the white sheet he wears. He's a zombie. Or this is a side effect of my temporary lift. The small lady leaps from the chair in the booth and takes off running. She runs past me with fear in her hazel-brown eyes. I take three steps back as Cato walks around the booth with a grin on his face. He appears happy, but I'm terrified. My armpits are suddenly slick from perspiration. What did he do to the lady? His practices seem shady now. Are Morgan and Scott right about the voodoo priest? He continues to come toward me, and now the smile has dissolved. The adrenaline sets in. If he says anything crazy, I will take off running the way she did. Harmony, what are you doing here? 
I want to leave, but now that he's closer in my presence, there is a sense of calm. It's peaceful, a rainbow after the storm. I came to ask you a question, but you're busy. I can come back. No, I'm not busy. You look worried. What's wrong? I pull my shirt and expose the tattoo. It's nearly strangling me. Can you tell me why this tattoo is getting larger? When did you get that? He extends his hands toward my neck. I jerk back, startling in fear. I wasn't scared he would strangle me before. I'm skeptical now. What I don't have time for is another person putting a spell on me, trying to control me. I've endured enough from Prentice, and I won't go through it again. Harmony, I will not hurt you, Cato says. I've never met a man similar to Cato. Someone who is dark and bright at the same time. My eyes are not deceiving me. That woman appeared to be in pain, running out of here like a jet, cradling a scarf. The whole place seems scary. What type of work are you doing here? Oh, you're talking about Penny running out of here? He shakes his head. It's not what it appears to be. I cross my arms and arch a questioning eyebrow in his direction. I want to know the truth. What's going on? Penny was here searching for her husband, and she brought me a piece of his clothing. I had to tell her he wasn't dead, but living with his other wife. For her, it's gut-wrenching. Oh, I understand. It's a relief for me. It makes sense. Now I'm more comfortable with him helping me with this tattoo. Can I take a peek at the tattoo now? I lift my head and turn my neck, exposing the right side. Rubbing his finger across my neck, he says, Yes, I know what kind of tattoo this is. There's pain in his voice, and the manner in which he spoke makes the hairs on the back of my neck stand. I lower my head and dart my gaze toward his eyes. What is it? He hangs his head and takes a step back. What is it? I put more pressure on him to tell me. He starts to speak, but his voice is low and shaky. It's a signature from the original caster. It tells what family the spell is from. He raises his head and stares at me. I'm stuck holding my breath, praying he won't tell me this tattoo is going to harm me or Mama. I'm only 19, but I know this isn't good news. Whatever it is, I don't want to know. I have not known all this time, so maybe it's best I stay away from the truth. I stop in mid-sentence. I'm sorry I came here. Maybe it's best I don't know. You have to know, he says with a cracking voice. A faint sensation washes over me. I better take a seat. I head towards his booth and have a seat on the plastic chair. It also tells me if there are any family who are still around to keep the curse alive. He sighs. There are plenty. What the fuck? How did my family get this curse? What will I do to save myself and my family? My head's now throbbing and spinning. He takes a seat next to me and draws in a deep breath. Wait. There's more. Holding back tears, I glare his way. More? There can't be any more. The tattoo is connected to the price you pay for the healings you provide. He twitches his hands, blinking repeatedly. I'm the one who is cursed. Does this mean if I have kids, the curse passes to them? I'm confused right now. The more healings you perform, the more the tattoo grows. I'm confused because the tattoo is growing with the curse on right now, and I have not done any healings, I explain. No, your abilities are still working. They are working to keep you alive. His face fills with worry. To keep me alive? My eyes widen. Okay, I'm having a panic attack. It's suddenly 200 degrees and I can't catch my breath. Calm down, Cato says. Calm? How can I stay calm? This is my life. Thunder pierces my throat. 
Once the vine covers your entire body, the magical abilities will cease to exist, and the curse will slide to someone else. But it means once the vine covers your body, you will cease to exist. The floodgates open as tears roll my cheeks. How can I be dying? Except for the fatigue and blurry vision, I'm fine. I eat well, I exercise. Why me? I've tried to be a good person. At least now I know everything. I'm dying, and I'm the one killing myself. Chapter 11 Staring at myself in the mirror sends me into a state of shock. My eyes have lost their deep color, and my face its bright shine. Dark circles and huge bags appear underneath my eyes. The tattoo has crept along my left arm, getting closer to my hand. What the hell is going on? I look like death. I've never seen death, but I imagine it has to be similar. I walk into the living room of my mother's house and see pictures of myself when I was younger and now. I look much older. Stress does real harm to your looks. Somehow this curse is tied to my childhood, and maybe I can get some insight from Mama. She watches her soap operas while having her morning cup of coffee. She holds the remote control in her hand and flicks the TV off when I take a seat. I need to talk to you. She narrows her gaze on me and sits the remote control on the couch. I'm concerned for you and the company you keep, she mutters. She's talking about Prentice coming over the other day. He is not the company I want to keep. He's a nightmare I can't escape. A heavy sigh escapes my lips. He's not the company I keep. I hang my head low, ashamed that my mother had to witness such hasty behavior. He's dangerous, with a dark essence and a venomous smile. She squints her green eyes the way she does when she's serious. Stay away from him, or he will take you to hell with him. Her facial muscles tighten. The words hit me in the gut. It's true, nothing good can come to me if I'm around a rogue soul. But, Mama... No buts. I've lived in Motor City long enough to know danger when I see it. She clears her throat and relaxes the muscles in her face. I've been clear-headed these last couple of days. I don't know why, Mama says. Usually the fog consumes my thoughts. We continue talking for hours. I haven't enjoyed her company in years. Either she is angry or her anxiety is getting the best of her. But right now, at this moment, she is the mother I remember before Dad died, when she enjoyed life. The second curse has to be executed. I don't want to die slow, just so I don't have to perform healings anymore. This curse is eternally handed from one generation to the next. The price my family has to pay for some wrongdoing in the past, I guess. The vision Mama and I see may be a clue. I give Mama a hug. I love you, Mama. Her floral perfume lingers on my shirt. Remember what I said. She closes her eyes and folds her legs in her meditating position. I nod and smirk. And for right now, I have my mother back. I scamper down the street because I can't wait to get home and tell Morgan what Cato said. I didn't tell Mama because I didn't want to freak her out. Besides, we had a great visit. I didn't want to lay the crummy news on her shoulders. It might send her mental state in a downward spiral. As I step on the porch, a hand comes around my mouth. Fear stabs at my stomach while anger invades my chest. What the fuck now? My muffled screams are not loud enough for anyone to hear, but I kick and scream all I can. The adrenaline flows through my blood. I try biting the huge hand around my mouth, but I can't get a good grip. I'm lifted off the ground as I kick and scream. It's a big man's arm that has me in a death grip. Next, I'm being tossed in the back of a van like a rag doll. I stare in disbelief at the man stuffing me inside the van. What the fuck is going on? I scream. I know him. He's the vampire who came to my job. He doesn't say shit. He just continues to slam the door. 
Only vampires kidnap an innocent witch for no reason. How the hell am I going to get out of here? Where the hell are they taking me? The van is dark and empty. I try to stay calm and decrease my racing thoughts. The van shoots down the streets. I know the curves and potholes in this town. We haven't left Silver City before the van comes to a halt. As soon as the door opens, my feet are coming out. A swift kick in the balls will get them off me. The lock clicks and the van door flies open. Prentice stands in front of the door with a snarl. What the hell is this, Prentice? He waves his hand. Come on out. I want to talk. I hop out of the van in the middle of an alley. The stench of warm garbage pierces my nostrils. I put a finger under my nose. What's so secret we need to meet in the alley? And why did you send your minions to kidnap me? Kidnap? He frowns. I've got good news. Don't worry. Everything is fine. I fold my hands and scowl at Prentice. I don't trust his snake ass, so I'm watching everything moving. Another man walks beside me wearing a long black trench coat. Darkness is glazed across his round face and his strong jawline. My stomach tingles and I inch away from him, just as the darkness jumps off his body. He is an evil spirit, a demon. He's tall with a thick build. My stomach balls in knots. I don't want to be around him. His spirit makes Prentice's spirit bright. It's okay. I have found a new cure for you so you can get back to healing. I will pay you a sizable fee, and anything you want is at your disposal, Prentice says. Anything? Yes, anything. New clothes, a car, anything you want. This is all very tempting. I want new clothes, but I'm not working for him for the rest of my life. If there is no other way to get rid of the curse, I'll eliminate Prentice. Before I could tell him I will be getting the curse back myself, tall darkness slaps another fucking collar around my neck. I jump back, wondering what the fuck his problem is. I glare at Prentice. He is doing his job. It's another collar, and will allow you to perform healings again. If I take another step, I might fall. The room is spinning and my mouth waters. And before I can complain, I find myself projectile vomiting all over the ground. I know exactly what the problem is, Prentice. He touches me, and suddenly my stomach pains stop. The world has stopped spinning. I glare at him. What did you do to me? He rubs his slick hair back in a ponytail and looks at Prentice. Someone tried breaking the curse. Prentice gives a puzzled look. What are you talking about? That's why she felt sick when I put the new collar around her neck. No, sir. You don't know what you were talking about. I rest my hand on my hip and get up in his face. No one tried anything on me. I cough and grab a napkin from my purse. Maybe you didn't know, but someone tried cursing you. It's broken now. The corners of his mouth turn up in a venomous grin. The darkness oozes from his spirit. Prentice will do anything to keep his illegal operation going. I'd healed many people he feeds on. They leave people nearly dead, sucking all the blood from their bodies, then come and get me to do the healings. It doesn't matter what time of day or night it is, or if I'm tired. They feed on humans mostly. Some they've even converted to vampires. You need to be careful of the company you keep, the dark man said. Any company I keep can't be any worse than Prentice. I'm not going to tell them Cato performed a curse on me. It's none of their business. The dark guy walks close to me and readjusts the collar. Please warn me before you touch me. He holds his hands in the air. I come in peace. When he touches me, shockwaves go through my body. His sickness is apparent. He needs healing, but he doesn't know he's sick, and I for damn sure want to tell him. I need to find Cato and fast. We have a lot of healings to do, so keep your phone on, Prentice says. Please don't call me in the middle of the night. I have a job. I roll my eyes and fold my arms. We have to make this money by any means necessary. 
Are you on board or not? Do I have an option? Even if I say no, they will come to my house anyway, demanding I come. Yeah, I'm on board. I have to play this game with him for a little longer, but as soon as I figure out a plan, I'm going to get rid of his ass. He has the whole town fooled or working for him, while he floats poison in the community. I will get rid of Prentice once and for all, or expose his ass of all his wrongdoing. Excuse my manners, I'm Randy. He extends his hand. I slap his hand and shoot him a mean stare. I'm Prentice's hoodoo priest. What the fuck? Prentice has a hoodoo priest working for him? A hoodoo priest is very similar to a voodoo priest. He has to know Cato. And it will come spilling out of his mouth any minute now. I don't trust his ass. His eyes are tight and sneaky looking. When you had the collar removed, the person you trusted cursed you. Maybe you didn't even realize it. The man is really slick, Randy says. I'm praying he doesn't tell Prentice it was Cato. I don't want Prentice to be after him for helping me. I consider him a friend now. This is my fault, my error in judgment, and the reason me and my family has to live in fear. Prentice narrows his gaze, his eyes peering under his bushy eyebrows. Staring at his lips, I get light-headed anticipating foul language to flow from his mouth. My knees turn to sponges and I fall to the unpaved alley, hitting my left leg on an empty beer bottle. I glance at the tattoo, which has now grown to the other arm. I sit here for seconds, unable to move. This luminous glow consumes the tattoo, a bright neon green glowing in the dark. The last thing I expected to ever happen does. Prentice extends his hand, and at first I flinch. Is this bastard going to hit me while I'm on the ground? He grabs my hand and helps me up. He has a heart underneath his tough exterior. He does have some kindness in him. But this doesn't excuse all the other scandalous shit he does. Who am I fooling? He doesn't care for me. He is protecting his assets. Prentice's eyes turn as big and round as saucers. What's wrong with this tattoo? He asks. After Randy examines the area, he cuts his eyes to Prentice, his eyes drooped like a sad puppy. It means she's dying. As it grows, her abilities to heal decrease. My body jerks at the words coming from his mouth. All magic comes with a price, and this is mine. Prentice stares at me with a sense of sympathy. It's one of the first times I've seen his gentle side. I can't be sure, but it seems genuine. I will do everything in my power to take care of you. Prentice lowers his head and looks at the floor. No need for him to have any empathy for me now. He didn't care when he was working me like a horse. However, it's not his fault I'm dying. This curse has haunted my family since long before I met him. I'm going to start by giving you a better place to live and not expecting you to clean up every mess. He glances over at Randy. Maybe we need to find another healer who can do some of the work. Shrugging. Where am I going to find another healer? Randy wonders. Don't worry. I will take care of everything. Prentice says before calling me an Uber. Chapter 12 my Uber comes to a halt next to a large moving truck parked in front of my apartment. My next-door neighbor, Mrs. Rose, watches from her porch. She always comes out to be nosy. She is a one-woman neighborhood watch committee. Screams come from the apartment, and I know it's Morgan's voice. Now, where has this happened before? I could swear this same big white truck and Morgan yelling at the movers happened yesterday. A black cat scurries onto the porch and peeks in the hall. Even the cat wants to know what all the commotion is for. Carrying my couch are two large men. They are buff and both have several tattoos. Not like the tattoo I have. My tattoo is blinking on one arm. It's not growing as quickly as it was before they threw the new collar around my neck. Still, I have to get this collar off. I'm not a branded animal. 
Hey, what's going on over there? Mrs. Rose asks. She has on a bathrobe and rollers. I've only seen her in clothes one time at the grocery store. The long brown locks of hair reaching mid-back complemented her thick shape. All she needs is a man. Then she could stay out of everybody's business. Everything is okay, Mrs. Rose. Morgan doesn't sound happy. She pulls her glasses off. She's yelling and screaming so loud she could wake the dead. My heart pounds rapidly as I race up the stairs, fearful of what I might observe. From the sounds of the screams, the movers are in trouble. I continue through the door to find Morgan with her fingers pointed directly in the face of one of the movers. He couldn't be any taller than five feet with a lean build. Morgan continues her verbal assault against the man. He put his head down and continued filling out a form. His face had turned a pale pink with the veins in his neck protruding. Ma'am, I'm doing the job they paid me to do, he says. Well, who the fuck paid you? Because I sure the fuck didn't. And this is my shit, Morgan says. The man takes off his hat and rubs his forehead. He seems really frustrated with Morgan, but she does not care. I grab Morgan. Let me talk to you for a minute. She cringes. This motherfucker is stealing our shit. No, they're not. Let's go in the kitchen. She keeps talking, her face flushed with anger. Once Morgan gets warm, it's hard to get her back to reality. She is a pistol. I yank her by the arm and drag her to the kitchen, which doesn't stop her from shouting swear words. I pulled my arms out to show my glowing tattoos. It brought silence to her mouth. She is choking at the sight of my arms. What happened to your arm? A lot. Everything will be okay. Prentice is going to move us to a better apartment. She frowns. Wait, for what? She shakes her head. Why would he do that? I'm sweating bullets because the ceiling fan is not circulating any air. Shit, I don't know how I'm going to weasel my way out of this one. Morgan hates Prentice almost as much as I do. You are free from the curse, right? Wait, you have the collar around your neck again. So what the hell is going on? I was, but... Scott races in the kitchen. Morgan, I came as soon as I could. Why are these men moving your furniture? We left on a rather tense moment, and now I feel awkward around Scott. I know I shouldn't. We are still best friends. But his scent drives me wild. Was it just a drunken moment we shared? It was one of the most fulfilling moments of my life. Imagine friendship and love together. Tell me what's going on, Morgan says. I was free. I couldn't perform any healings, and my mama, she was normal. My curse is tied to my childhood, I think. I nervously continue to ramble. Doesn't explain why Prentice would get us a better apartment. Her eyes bulge. Scott's jaw flexes under his skin, and he sighs deeply. He seems to be shocked or disgusted that I will accept help from my oppressor. I need to shoot it straight and get to the point. I have no other choice. I didn't want the apartment from Prentice, but you see this tattoo? Once my entire body is covered, I could die. Morgan's mouth drops as her eyes fill with tears. Did you say die? She mumbles. This is the lowest her voice has been all day. Scott blinks and his face became pale, as if all the blood has disappeared, like he's staring at a ghost. Yes, I'm going to find Cato. He will know what to do, I whisper. The movers are still up front, scratching the floor with our furniture. I didn't want them to hear me since they work for Prentice. This is the curse's way of telling me when my magic is done. I want it to be over now. I want my life back. I want my mother to be happy. We have to go along with this apartment thing for now. Morgan nods her head. She's concerned for my well-being, and so is Scott. But I got myself in this mess, and I will find a way out, with Cato's help. I go searching for Cato. I know he can help. I've got to get this collar off and this curse reversed. Cato! I scream, hoping he would appear. My hands tremble as I view my long, ugly tattoo. 
It's taking over. I scream, Cato! My voice shaking and tears flowing. I need his help. Don't fail me now. My pace is a jog as my feet pound into the ground, causing a mini quake. I need to get away. I need to get out of this body. I slow my jog now to a brisk pace. I get to the heights and head straight for the burnt ridge dead-end street I found him at before. This is the only place I know to look for him, since he didn't answer my call. I get to Burnt Ridge and there's a parade of people. I continue to the last booth. A trickle of fear enters my chest. I'm paralyzed with fear. What will I see? The last time, Cato's dealings looked sketchy. Will he be sacrificing a chicken? Putting a curse on someone? I get to the booth and gasp. It is worse than I imagined. He isn't there. Damn, where can he be? I exhale and stay calm. Walking away from Burnt Ridge, I had no idea where he could be. The coffee shop is closed, and I guess I won't find him tonight. Thump. Thump. The sound is coming from the alley, followed by yelling. I sneak behind the garbage can and hold my breath. I'm breathing loud, and I can't control it. Oh, shit, it's Cato. I cover my mouth to muffle my screams. I don't want anyone to hear me. There is a tall dude who drives his fist into Cato's face while he's held by another dude. Keep your motherfucking nose out of my business. The voice of Randy. Oh, damn, they are beating Cato because of me. I bite the inside of my mouth. What should I do? Calling the police won't help. The police don't come to this area. The tall dude punches Cato in the stomach. He doesn't say anything. His face bruised, his right eye closed. They will kill him. My chest is on fire. I didn't know how long I could stay behind this garbage can. I wipe the tears from my cheeks. My heart beats ferociously like it might explode. I've never been this scared in my life. My lungs are screaming for air. I can't catch my breath fast enough. When I ask for your help, you can give it. But until then, stay away, Randy says before he slaps the shit out of Cato. Sweat and saliva swing through the air with that slap. They continue pounding on him over and over. It's brutal, and on the inside, I'm screaming. If I say anything, will they kill me? I can't take on three men. I get nauseated at Cato's swollen, bruised, bloody face. I kneel on the ground, wishing this was over. The best thing Prentice could have done is giving me my powers back. I know I can heal him, but only if he's alive after this beating. A coward hiding behind a dumpster while a friend is beaten? What have I become? Harmony is someone you are to keep your hands off, Randy says. He punches him again. Do I make myself clear? Cato coughs and blood spills to the ground. I have taken measures to ensure Harmony stays under my protection, Randy says. What does he mean, protection? I feel the metal collar around my neck. Is there something in this damn collar? Randy swings one last punch, knocking Cato to the ground. The three men hop into a black SUV with tinted windows and peel out of the alley. Cato's lifeless body lies on the ground. I'm scared to go over and see him lying there. What if he's dead? There's nothing I can do about the dead. I can't bring anyone back to life. Chapter 13 I nearly slip on a bottle racing to Cato's side. The dim light from the moon shines on Cato's body, and fear rips through my being. The rise and fall of his chest has ceased. His face pale with no blush, his lips blue, his body still with no movement. How can I help him? I can't raise the dead. I will be cursed for eternity with the pressure of carrying around the death of Cato on my shoulders. This isn't for Cato. He did nothing. A slight movement of his boot made my adrenaline rush. I'm tripping. I only assumed I saw his feet move. I drop to my knees and grab his wrist. The thrum of a faint pulse under my fingers gives me hope. 
He's barely clinging to life, but this is all I need to save him. I grab the small bottle of water from my pocket. Never leave home without it. I never know when I'd be summoned for a healing. I rub the water on my hands. As I dip into my magic, the feeling is not as intense. It's a sense of cleansing, but not so calm. There is no overwhelming need to heal. I grab Cato's arm anyway, and I feel nothing. I'm not sure where the problem is. Everything is hazy. I exhale and rub my face. Something is wrong with my magic. My magic has been stolen from me. Maybe it has something to do with this damn collar that's choking my neck. Tugging at the collar, I nearly break a nail trying to pry it off. I unfasten it and pull, and it doesn't move. I feel for the latch, and it's fastened again. What the fuck is wrong with this thing? I try to unfasten it again, and I get it open, but I can't get the collar off my neck. Blood is now flowing from the lips of Cato. My heart is heavy. I have to do something. There has to be an internal bleed. It's a matter of time before he dies. Cato! Cato! I scream, nudging at his arm, hoping he would awaken and say he is fine. But he didn't. I can't believe my magic isn't working. I graze him with my fingertips, and there is no buzz or tingling. What kind of healer can't do magic? On the inside, I'm screaming over why my magic is failing me now. I can't think straight. The tattoo is getting lighter, and the world around me is collapsing. I'm sure someone heard the commotion and called the police. No matter what, I won't leave Cato's side. This is no time for me to freak out. Cato's life is in my hands. I close my eyes and dig deeper, hoping to get to my magic. A rush of adrenaline consumes me. A floating sensation enters my being, as if I'm sitting on a cloud. No tingling in my fingers, no magic, but it's a euphoric feeling, as if I'm above the earth. My being is telling me everything is fine, and Cato will be fine. I open my eyes to make sure I'm still sitting on the ground in a dark alley. I was, but the alley looks different. A green highlight had consumed the alley. My heart races and I lean back. What the hell is going on? Scanning the alley, I watch for someone shining a light, but no one is here except me and Cato. Everywhere I turn, the green light is there. I put my hand in front of my eyes and my hand is green. Pain engulfs my stomach. I want to run, but I can't leave Cato. I look at the broken window, only to find it's now repairing itself. I know now what's going on. Somehow, my magic is coming from my eyes. And it's stronger than ever. In the past, I could only heal people, but now I can heal windows. This is intimidating. Viewing the broken glass bottle, I watch it repair itself. Everything the green light touches is repairing itself. I look at Cato, and within seconds his hands move. His eyes are still closed. His breathing is now labored. But the bronze color has lightened his face, his lips now pink. I check his pulse, which is fast and thready. He slightly adjusts his head. Cato? His eyes pop open. The light in his spirit dim but present. He coughs and a small amount of blood comes from his mouth. You saved me. He grimaces. We are in trouble. We have to go. Chapter 14 I grab Cato's arm and help him to his feet. He grabs his stomach and grimaces. His iris is red, the skin around his eye purple, his lip swollen. He takes a step and limps the rest of the way to the street. I hold his arm, helping him to a red sedan. He doesn't need a vehicle. I didn't know if he had a car or drove. He always seems to pop up. Police sirens wail in the background, a little too late since the brawl is over. The police car zooms past us. I'm crippled with fear Randy might return. 
I'm having an out-of-body experience. This can't be real. I'm trapped in the clouds that dance above our heads. I'm staring down on the tragedy. But I'm not. It's real life, and Cato is bruised and battered. I slip in the car, and the stench of raw garlic invades my nostrils. I'm captured by the silence. I don't know what to say. I almost got Cato killed. There's nothing I can say to make it better. He looks straight, not stopping at the red lights, not talking. He is in a hurry to get wherever our destination is. I'm scared to ask. Never mind the smell of garlic, it keeps the demons away, he suddenly says. I nod, although I never knew demons hate the smell of garlic. Perfuming my house with garlic might keep Prentice away. I tug at the collar and it slips off this time. Before, I couldn't get this collar to move. I throw it to the floor of the car in frustration. I felt helpless and hopeless for Cato and myself. My heart pounds at the possibility I will never be free from Prentice or this curse. Cato glances at the collar. Did Randy put the collar on you? He sounds different from when he had pain in his voice. Anger is apparent on his face. I had been flirting with danger, and now he came to destroy. He did. I swallow hard. I'm so lost. Everything is illuminated. I'm seeing the world in 3D. Before, my vision was blurry, but now it's amazing. The moon is a brighter white, the grass a richer green. The world is beautiful and vibrant. I glare at a broken light. It repairs itself like the window did. Someone is playing an awful game, or this magic is next level. I heal people, not things. Stop repairing everything, Cato says. I can't. It keeps happening. If I could stop, I would. My magic has gotten stronger. Not sure if this is a good thing or not. I didn't ask for this magic. I had to dig deep to save Cato's life, and this happened. Take a nap. It may wear off. I'm not sleepy. I yawn. Harmony. Harmony. I feel a nudge on my shoulder and I open my eyes. Cato stares at my face. I sit up. Where are we? At my house. I wasn't sleepy, but I fell asleep. I yawn. Are you going to take me home? No, you'll be safer here. No one knows where I live. He is right. I'm sure Randy and Prentice are at my house right now. He's mysterious. He has a car and an apartment. I never envisioned him having these things. Is he married? Where are we? In Troy. Just a little quieter than the city. I raise an eyebrow in his direction. Is it safe to be alone in a house with him? At this point, there's no other choice. Troy. I've heard of Troy. A lot of dragons live in Troy. He can't be a dragon. He waves his hand. Come on in. My instincts are telling me to be careful. Did anyone follow us here? Here goes nothing. I follow him up concrete steps to a brick apartment with a black iron screen door. We go inside and my body temperature drops as goosebumps fill my arms. The apartment wasn't cold, though. It's the chickens with missing heads lying on the table. Is he sacrificing chickens? He is a voodoo priest, but I consider him different, maybe because he's young. The odd furniture is neon yellow with specks of red. A large clock hangs on the wall. Problem is, it doesn't work. Who has a broken clock in their house? I'm trying to be open-minded. Just because he's different doesn't mean he doesn't have a good heart. But this is some freaky shit. Don't be frightened. Come in. I stall for a second, then enter the front door and follow Cato to the kitchen. No way I'm sitting on the couch, and not because of the color. 
The couch is worn, ancient even. It sags in the center. If I take a seat on the couch, it will collapse. I have a seat at the kitchen table. I find myself staring at the plaques on the wall. Do you want something to drink? He grabs a bottle of water and takes a quick gulp. No thanks. I'm creeped out by the apartment. I won't be eating anything out of here. What happened? He asks while taking a seat across the table from me. I can't get the words out fast enough. That Randy dude, along with some others, kidnapped me. Randy slapped the collar on my neck. But why? I didn't know Prentice and Randy had any dealings, Cato mutters. I didn't either. Randy introduced himself as Prentice's hoodoo priest. His eyes widen. Yes, I know Randy. He practices. He also hangs out at Burnt Ridge. He's dangerous for sure. If you want the curse lifted, it's going to be a tedious task. Thinking of my mother and how for a short period she's fine and normal. Yes, let's break this fucker. Chapter 15 The bang and bump from the next room is terrifying. What is Cato doing? Cato comes from a bedroom tucked in a corner next to the back door, carrying a large brown box labeled Magic. He sits the box on the floor next to the table and rummages. I'm sitting on the edge of my seat waiting for him to pull the contents from the box. I silently pray it's something to remove this curse once and for all. My stomach rumbles, reminding me how hungry I am. I haven't eaten since earlier today. And since the altercation where Cato was beaten, hunger is the last thing on my mind. He pulls out a large book. A spell book. I know what it is. I had one at my house. It was given to me by my father. It was given to him by his mother, who received it from her mother. I've never used it. Don't know how. The ceiling fan turns above my head and I realize I'm freezing. It's humid outside, so I won't complain. We can't stay long. I have to get home and check on Morgan. He pulls a colorful arcane object from the box, a purple crystal and some herbs. Why does he need all this stuff? I thought he was a voodoo priest. This is dark magic. The purple crystal is the prettiest I've seen. The sight of the crystal has me mesmerized. But there's a crack in it. It's sick. It needs healing. Don't touch anything, Cato yells, moving the objects to the left side of the table. I blink, realizing I'm staring at the crystal. I'm nervous. He has never said anything so forceful, and now he's an angry grizzly bear growling. But all the objects needed healing. The crystal appears in dire need of help. The feeling I get from the crystal is overwhelming. If he's going to heal me with the spell book, I want to view it first. I don't want any more of those scary-ass visions he showed me before. Maybe the crystal is what I needed to break this curse. It sticks out so much. I stare at the crystal hard and it repairs itself. And now it's glowing neon green like my tattoo was earlier. I grab the crystal. I need to touch it. The warmth soothes my cold hands. Cato leaps across the table and snatches the crystal from my hands. His face is red with rage. I jerk back in my chair. My pulse skyrockets. What's wrong with him? Since we got here, he has been on edge. Not everything needs to be healed. Wrinkles appear on his forehead like cracking ice. He paces the floor back and forth from the sink to the kitchen table. Um, I know, but the crystal had a crack. It's okay. Forcing my mouth to make words. I didn't know he had such a dark side. I'm in shock. Where's the nice guy with the contagious smile? Do you know what you have done? Damn it! He slaps the table, causing the crystal to shake, then grabs his hand and winces in pain. I flinch at the tone of his voice. 
there was a different person in there. Maybe he got hit upside the head one too many times. I will let him blow off some steam and de-escalate. He takes a seat in the chair. The balls of his feet must be on fire from the pacing. I'm sorry if I scared you. The owner of the crystal is a man I cursed. He deserved to be cursed and never forgiven. There is pain in his voice when he speaks of the man he cursed. I don't know what the man did. I'm not sure I want to know. But whatever it is, wasn't good. It's okay. I understand you're frustrated. Yeah, but I have no right to take it out on you. He hangs his head. He excuses himself from the table and goes into the bathroom. Even though I'm angry at what he said, I'm still responsible for the beating he took. And he has been helping me. I didn't pay him anything. He comes back from the bathroom with a heating pad in his hand. What's wrong? I ask. My shoulders, they are sore, but it's fine. No. I stand and walk over to him. Let me help you. I'm good with massaging the pain away. He slips off his shirt, exposing his chest and his chiseled abs. It's a shock. I didn't know he had a six-pack under those weird clothes he wears. I don't know how I'm thinking of Cato in a sexual way, but it's something about him. His warm touch, his white straight teeth, the way his eyes twinkle when he smiles. I edge around the chair, facing his back, to massage his shoulders. His back is filled with red and purple bruises. I touch his shoulder and he groans. I massage his shoulders slowly at first, then a little deeper. He groans, but the soreness will go away once my magic touches his internal flesh. He holds his right hand up, signaling me to stop. I freeze with my hands still on his shoulders. He shrugs his shoulders and moves his head from side to side. A cracking sound comes from the neck area. He lets out a sigh and his shoulders drop. The tension slides off his neck. My job is done. I know he feels better, and it didn't take much magic. My fingers barely tingled. I go back to my seat. He sits with his eyes closed as if he's meditating. We sit in silence. The suspense is killing me. Is he going to say anything? All I can see is his six-pack staring at me. I feel better. The pain is gone. You have a gift. He opens his eyes. Are you sure you're ready to get rid of your gift? I hesitantly nod my head. I'm sure I want to be free. But if I couldn't perform healings, Cato would be dead right now. He slides the herbs to the middle of the table. This is the first step. You could lose some of your memories. Chapter 16 This will be painful and tedious. It might not work, Cato says. I clutch my invisible pearls. What if I go through this process and the curse remains? The person who placed this curse on your family is powerful. The curse is one of the strongest I've seen. His eyes grow bigger and wider. He grabs the book of spells and flips through the pages. I'm getting to a point where I can use my magic and not get so tired. It feels good to have respect from the other supernaturals. It's possible you will remain cursed forever. I'm getting dizzy from all this information. I glare at Cato innocently as I try to contain my composure. What I want to say is, is this shit real? Why me? I'm beyond pissed. Who would have ever thought to curse my family? I'm sure he would agree this situation is not a good one for me. Other people have had curses, but never as strong as the curse placed upon my family. I wonder what one of my ancestors did that was so heinous that such a strong curse was initiated. Since gaining visual healing, the tattoo has not increased in size. It's not glowing, and I'm not tired. It could be a good thing. I'll keep it to myself. 
I'm sure. I want to try. He gathers a small cup of water and drops a few herbs into it. Steam flows from the top. The water is piping hot. The scent of mint fills the kitchen. He slides the cup across the table. I grab the cup and turn my head. The scent is strong. The strongest scent of mint I've encountered. But if it will strip the curse, I'll try it. I take a swallow when my phone vibrates. I peek at the phone screen. Morgan's name flashes across the screen. Hello? You need to get here, Morgan yells over the phone. I'm on my way home. All of our stuff is gone. Okay, I'm coming. Then to Cato, who's flipping pages, I've got to get home. I hope he's given me the right remedy this time. He grabs a lid from the cabinet and covers the cup. This will have a lasting effect on you. I'm hoping a good effect. Be sure, when you finish step one, this is what you want. It wasn't the answer I wanted to hear, but maybe it's true. Is it as hard for people to forget as it is for me? I can't help but think maybe he is angry at me for the beating he took. Is this potion safe to drink? Randy said whoever tried to break the curse fooled me. I'll keep the potion and drink it later. The movers are driving off as I arrive. Morgan's face is red, but she isn't shouting or swearing. Night has fallen. The moon is bright. It cuts through the thick fog consuming Silver City. Morgan shoots me a mean stare with her hands on her hips. They told me to follow them. They didn't tell me where we're going, she says. What are we going to do? She asks, following me inside the apartment. My footsteps echo through the living room. All that's left on the floor are mismatched socks and old bills. I walk in the kitchen with Morgan's continuous blabbing, trailing behind me. The kitchen is bare. All that remains is the cursed yellow curtains and the twirling ceiling fan. Who's going to pay the rent at this new apartment? This shit doesn't make any sense. Morgan whines. Prentice, and it will be fine. I give her a dismissive wave and race to my bedroom, finding a pair of old sneakers and the vanilla scent of my body mist. I'll find the address, Morgan. Let's go. I scan my contacts on my phone and send a text to Prentice asking the address to the new apartment. I'm not telling her about the beating Cato took. She would have an anxiety attack and she wouldn't go to any apartment affiliated with Prentice. We slip out of the apartment and step onto the stoop. A guy across the street catches my eye and waves me over. I narrow my gaze and concentrate on his face. His face is familiar, but I can't put my finger on it. It's foggy. Possible I don't know him at all. I tuck away the potion in my purse. I contemplate drinking it now, but I'll wait till later. My tattoo isn't growing anymore. Who is he? Morgan whispers to me as we creep down the stairs. I squint and recognize Brian, a dragon who lives around the corner. I tremble. What the hell would Brian be calling me for? I'll be right back, Morgan, I say, and we walk towards Morgan's car. I get closer to Brian, my vision sharp. He wears a red and black jacket with black jeans. It wasn't typical for the dragons. The dragons usually wore blue. What is this shit all about? He better not try to intimidate me, because with one sharp stare I will destroy his ass. Chapter 17 he pulls his hands out of his pockets, and I'm on alert. He smiles, his blue eyes tracing my body from head to toe. I sense there is more he wants to say, but he doesn't. His eyes are mysterious, like he's hiding something. What's up, Harmony? Hey. He acts as if I don't know dragons are into it with, well, everybody. At least that's what I heard. We do have one major thing in common— 
I can't stand Prentice, and the dragons can't either. He scans the scene. I heard you had a problem? He steps closer to me. Oh, yeah? What problem? I can feel the heat radiating off his body. The dragons stay hot, and they can melt you in a matter of seconds. I'm not scared of him. I've known him most of my life, and the dragons never fuck with anyone without reason. Prentice! He rubs his hands together. Help me help you? What do you have in mind? Brian's superpower is he's a planner. He always maps things out. He has plan A and B and C. He was a great planner in high school. He always had a theory and an outcome of everything. Too bad he doesn't use his smarts for something constructive. Before he can tell me what plan A is, we're surrounded. Three of Prentice's workers stand around us like we're new victims they want to sink their teeth into. Three has multiplied into six. Some of these guys I don't know. What the fuck, Dan? Brian says, walking within inches of Dan's face. He's a husky guy with a mean sneer. His fist is the size of a cantaloupe. It's time for me to get the hell out of here. I'm not getting my ass kicked for Prentice, Brian, or anybody else. Morgan gets out of the car and makes her way over, as a masked figure walks in my face. The mask, a golden-black color which isn't the dragon's color, not sure who he is. What's the problem here? He says. His creepy voice sends goosebumps up my leg. A werewolf with thick brown fur prowls with him and sniffs around my feet. The masked man must be supernatural. Who else walks around with a werewolf? He removes his mask and opens his coat, then pulls out a small purple bottle. My heart skips a beat and my hands tremble. What's in his hand? This is a potion, he says with a smile, his beard checkered with black and gray his teeth sharp and the color of slime. I have never seen him around. He glances at the bottle and narrows his gaze at me. He hands the bottle to me, and before I could grab it, No, thank you, Morgan says. She grabs my arm and turns to leave. He lets out a loud scream, piercing my eardrums, rendering me immobile for a few seconds. I turn as he lunges toward me and Morgan. My first instinct is to run, but he's nearly on my back. Besides, I'm here to make a plan with the dragons to get Prentice off my back. I'll be damned if a crazy-ass supernatural will run me off. Morgan slides her foot, which becomes entangled with the masked man. He falls to the ground. The werewolf lunges at me, knocking me down as well. Do werewolves eat witches? I would rather find out when one's not standing in front of me. I spring back to my feet with my eyes on my enemy. The werewolf may have four legs and razor-sharp teeth, but I have witch dust in the bracelet. I snap the bracelet loose, crack open one charm, and fling the red dust in the eyes of the werewolf. He steps back, whimpering in agony. I hiss over my shoulder at the supernatural and tell him not to move. He continues getting off the ground, looking at his werewolf. He lunges toward me. I attempt to crack open another charm, but it's too late. His nails are scratching my bare face. With one swift sweep, I knock him back to the ground, blood trickling from my face. I stand over him, staring down at his face. Instead of seeing how to heal him, I see how to take him out and make him ill to the point of death. I know if I stare long enough, I could kill him with my gaze. Another man walks alongside of me and whispers something, and before I know it, the man falls to the ground in agony, holding his abdomen whimpering. I yell at Morgan to get in the car at this moment. I don't look at her because I have no control over my sight. Now, Morgan! I scream. Seconds later, the clack of her shoes hitting the pavement gives me relief. A dragon walks toward me. I know him from around the way. I'm trying to take control of my vision, but if he gets too close, he's going to get a swift ass-kicking. A hard whack to my head, and everything goes black. Chapter 18 
With my head pounding, I reposition myself, unable to open my eyes. A heady, distinct aroma of tainted blood fills the air. Prentice is near. I exhale and blink, trying to pry my eyes open. The room is dark and unfamiliar. I hold my breath, trying to block the scent. I exhale, and it's still present and stringent. My laser-sharp vision should highlight the room, but it's not working. I try pulling my right arm to my chest, but there is resistance. I can't move either of my hands. They're tied behind my back. I stay calm and rub my face across the surface I lay on, the smooth, cold texture of leather. I'm confused, staring at my surroundings, not sure how I got here. A cracked vase sits on a brown table in the corner. I narrow my gaze and concentrate, hoping to repair the vase. But nothing happens. It doesn't move. Shit, my healing is gone. What happened? The sound of deep voices in close proximity reaches my ears, but I can't see anyone. Two deep baritone voices. One voice is Prentice, the other who knows. My racing thoughts drown out the voices. I've got to get the hell out of here. The footsteps get closer and my eyelids quiver. What are they going to do to me? If I'd known this was my last day on Earth, I would have spent more time with Mama. What would she do if I'm gone? As I struggle to free myself, a second set of steps echo. My body is rigid with fear and I have the mother of all headaches. Someone flicks the light switch on the wall. And there stand Prentice and Randy, both with blank expressions on their faces. My face warms from terror and a roll of sweat trickles down my back. Randy scutters toward me and my heart nearly explodes. This shit didn't go as planned. He reaches in his pocket and I close my eyes. If this is the end, I don't want Randy's face to be my last vision. A jingling sound. Then he grabs my right arm and tilts my body forward. The clank of the handcuffs sliding off my wrist is music to my ears. I open my eyes to Prentice's wide smile with a twinkle in his eyes. I'm happy you are awake. Are you okay? He steps closer to the couch. I sit up and scan the room, wondering what the hell is going on. I'm stuck in the twilight zone. The floral wallpaper was a dead giveaway of how long it's been since he decorated this house. The pictures and furniture are all antique. Judging by the way Randy is barefoot and wearing shorts, I assume this is his house. He's got to be over a hundred years old, because some of this furniture is. Prentice takes a seat on the couch next to me. Do you know what you have done? Prentice says. Something no other healer has been able to do. You have tapped into powers I have never seen before, Randy says. His face is bright. I can hear the excitement in his voice. It's dangerous, you know. Other people might see you as a weapon. Keep the collar on, Prentice says. No, I don't need the collar anymore. What? Yes, you do, Randy says. He darts his eyes and attention to Prentice. She needs to be kept under surveillance at all times. No one can get near her. She is our most valuable asset. Prentice stands. I know. I've got this. With her, we could take over everything, Randy says. Everything? They're trying to take over everything? I won't be a part of this. They don't know it yet, but my visual healing is dead, and I hope it never comes back. If Prentice wants to go around controlling other paranormals, he won't get my help. Prentice and Randy can figure this out alone. Prentice and Randy march out the living room, toward the hallway. I sit up on the couch, curious where they're going. Randy stops and pivots. No, you stay here. She can come, Prentice says. He waves his hand. Come on. I follow the duo through a dark hall to a bright room. The light in the room was fluorescent, and so bright it brought pain to my eyes. 
I use my hand to block the light. Prentice unplugs one lamp from the wall and leaves the overhead light on. The room is tiny, and a huge waist-high table in the center takes up the majority of the space in the room. I'm getting claustrophobic. A large map and a computer sit upon the table. Small pins are stuck in different areas of the map. First, we start here, then move here, Randy says, pointing at the map. It was a map of Michigan. What do you think, Harmony? Prentice says. About what? I shrug. I know he is not asking me to be any part of this plan he has. Us taking over, not just Silver City and Night Heights. I'm looking at the big picture. I want Detroit. My mouth drops and goes dry. His evil ass. I knew he had a dangerous plan. I bite the inside of my mouth, holding back my words. I can't let him know how I really feel. He's treating me like a trusted ally, letting me in on his plans. That's what I want, him to believe we're working together. The other paranormals work together as gangs. The dragons work for the dragons, and this is their area. Randy says, pointing to a spot on the map. The elves work for the elves here. The shifters live and work here. Randy looks at Prentice, then me. No one keeps them under control. That's the reason there is so much needless crime, Prentice says. The room temperature drops with my heart to my feet. These two are dark and twisted. Randy looks at Prentice like he's a shiny new toy on Christmas morning. I will make all of them my slaves. They will all work for us. Prentice folds his arms and his lips curl into a smile, exposing his fangs. All the wind is knocked out of my body. I can't breathe. I take a seat in the chair. A tightening sensation consumes my chest. This must be what a heart attack feels like. I cover my face with my hands. Harmony, this is good news. Don't worry, you will work for me. You won't be a slave. Chapter 19 How the hell do I get myself into this shit? I'm riding in the back of the car Randy is driving. He's supposed to take me to my new apartment, my new life. He's the person I hate most in this world next to Prentice. Prentice may be too simple to know but Randy knows I hate his ass. I'm not sitting in the passenger seat. It's too close. Some of his devious ways may rub off on me. Are you excited to see your new house? My eyes dart around the car. He must be talking to someone else. I don't have to say anything to him. He looks at me in the rearview mirror with raised eyebrows. I stare back, then roll my eyes and glance out the window. I see a young girl jumping rope on the sidewalk. Wishing it was me, I lean back in the seat. Remembering the time Morgan and I were kids, had no worries, no fears. Those were the best times of our lives. My life will be normal once I destroy these assholes. The car stops and I look at the house. This isn't Silver City or Night Heights. Where the hell are we? I ask with an attitude. Your new home, Randy says. Is this a supernatural community? No, this is Bayside. No paranormals live here. Why the hell would Prentice get me an apartment in a human community? The streets are clean and the birds chirp. It is nice, and I can blend in with humans. I guess it will be safe for me and Morgan. I get out of the car as Randy is saying goodbye. I slam the door. Which building is it? The gray one. 627, first floor. Randy says, pointing to the left. The building is three floors with a glass door and brass numbers. I roam toward the building which has a wrought iron gate with doorbells. I twist the knob and find the gate is locked. Aren't you forgetting something? Randy says. I turn and he sits there with a sneer, jingling a set of keys in his hand. 
I walk to the car and snatch the keys, and he slaps a collar around my neck. I jump back and grab at my throat. The collar doesn't move. What the hell is this for? I noticed your last one was gone. I know someone helped you break it, so I gave you a new one. He winks. I can't stand this motherfucker. As soon as he leaves, I'm snatching the shit off. Opening the doors of the apartment makes me jittery. I'm on alert, as there's no way to know who's in here. The apartment is dead silent. I see my furniture from the old apartment and stacks of boxes. I don't see Morgan. The living room has a large picture-framed window. The apartment is spotless. No dust or cracks in the walls. I could get accustomed to this. But I have to remember who this came from. In the blink of an eye, this could all vanish. I walk past the dining room into the kitchen. My heart thunders. I'm not sure if I'm going to have to kick someone's ass. There is a rumbling sound and I twist backward, but nothing's there. A few seconds later, the rumbling sound is there again. It's coming from the black refrigerator. I walk over and swing the door open. There's an ice maker at the top of the freezer. I exhale and wipe the sweat from my forehead. The real question is, where is Morgan? I grab my phone and the screen is black. Damn, the battery is dead. I look out the kitchen window and see a deck in the backyard and a large garage. This place has grass and flowers and doorbells. Totally different from our apartment in Silver City. The rent here must be extreme. I go into the hall and stand in the middle, surrounded by wooden doors. Opening the middle door is what I need, the bathroom. The tub and shower are surrounded with white ceramic tile. There's also a fancy mirror with huge light bulbs attached to the top. Yes, the place is fancy, but I'm more concerned about Morgan. I walk back to the living room and find the box labeled electronics. I dig through the box and find a charger. I find an outlet and plug my phone in. I go back into the kitchen as my stomach rumbles. Guess I could fix myself something to eat. My hands tremble at the thought of Morgan being hurt. I need to talk to Mama. She could help calm me down. The last thing I remember is me yelling at Morgan to get into the car. But I didn't see her car parked out front. Maybe she went to her mama's house. I grab a skillet from the cabinet and put it on the stove. I'm going to cook my favorite and the thing I cook the best, French toast. Before I get the skillet on the burner, my phone is pinging with a bunch of texts. I walk back to the living room and grab my phone. It's on 8%, but I have seven texts. With my finger hovering over the text messages, I click the one from Morgan. There are five from her. They all say the same thing. Where are you? I'm scared. Scared? Does someone have her, or is she scared for me? She didn't do anything, so I'm sure she's fine. I go back into the kitchen and put butter and cinnamon in the skillet. I take a deep inhale. I love the smell of warm cinnamon. As I grab the bread from the top of the refrigerator, I hear the creak of footsteps on the wood floor. My pulse increases. I freeze and hold my breath. Whoever is in here is getting their ass whipped. I thought I was in here alone. Anxiety skitters through my heart. What do I do now? The creak from the wooden floor echoes through the apartment. I need to get my phone. It's in the living room past the hall. The footsteps pause. The person must be as frightened as I am. Or they're waiting for me to make the first move. I'll chop them straight in the esophagus. I walk back toward the dining room, wringing my hands. The skin on my arms prickle with goosebumps. Whoever the hell is in here, you better make it known. I shout. Harmony! Morgan races from the hall and grabs me, giving me a bear hug with such force I nearly fall to the floor. I thought they killed you! she says with tears in her eyes. No, I'm fine. Those bastards have other things in mind. She puts her index finger to her lips, shushing me. 
She waves her hand and walks toward the back door and out on the deck. I follow, wondering if there is someone else here she's afraid of. We step outside on the deck. You can't talk on the inside. What do you mean? My eyes twitch as I take a seat. They have cameras in the house. They can see and hear us. I lean back in the chair. Really, I have become a prisoner. This is not a new house for me and Morgan. It's a prison cell. They have a plan. They want to take over all of the supernaturals in Detroit and make them slaves. Morgan's eyes get big and she holds her chest, her breathing labored. What are we going to do? I don't have a plan yet. She points to the collar. They gave you a new one? Yeah. I grab at it and it zaps me, sending a buzz down my right hand. I jerk and remember how I got it off the last time. I will get it off, not now, but soon. A bird swoops in, landing on the chair next to me. The bird has feathers the color of a rainbow and steel gray eyes. If it weren't for the feathers, I would have thought it was an angel. Different from any bird I've seen before. I want to touch its feathers, but I'm frightened. The bird shifts into a woman with short red hair and brown eyes. Cato wants to see you. He's at a protected location, the woman says. I need help. He has the allies you need. You have to come alone. I was expecting her to have the scent of a bird, but she has the aroma of peaches. She gives me the address, and as fast as she came, she shifts into a bird and leaves. Chapter 20 Morgan and I scurry back into the apartment. I view the burnt butter and cinnamon in the skillet and turn the stove off. I'm starving. I smelled your cinnamon and butter. You are making French toast? Glaring at the skillet, I say... Yeah, I was, but I have a taste for pizza. Let's go out and get some. Morgan scratches her leg as her eyes dart around the kitchen. I can tell when Morgan's nervous. Okay. She hesitates, then rises to her feet. She keeps glancing around the room, afraid someone will come. Then the doorbell rings, and she twirls her finger around locks of her hair. Oh shit, who the hell is at the door? Did they hear the shifter on the back porch? Balls of tension settle in my stomach. I could vomit, I'm so nervous. Morgan sits. They're not looking for me. I creep toward the door. Who is it? I ask from the dining room. I'm not getting close to the door. Pizza! A male voice shouts. Pizza? Who the hell ordered a pizza? I had a taste for it, but I didn't order it. I inch closer to the door. Then I glance out the peephole. There stands a scrawny, blonde-headed teenager with a pizza box in his hand. I open the door gingerly. Pepperoni pizza for Harmony Adams? He says while handing me the box. Okay, thanks. Let me give you a tip. No thanks, I already got one he says before racing to his car. A tall, buff man waits at the front gate. He looks like the man in black working security. I slam the door and continue to the kitchen with the pizza. That was fast, Morgan says. Every time we ask, will food come? Her eyes widen and she grabs a slice of pizza. I'm sure it's a coincidence. Laughable at the least. I want to go to the club. We both pause and nothing happens. Morgan busts out laughing. I snicker at her laugh. It's loud and she snorts. The doorbell rings and I'm taken aback. They bugged this place. They couldn't possibly bring a place to us. Morgan goes to the door first this time, so I follow. She gets to the door and looks through the peephole. She twists around with wide eyes, holding her chest. There's a gang of people, she whispers. Open the door. I'm curious. 
Where did these people come from? She opens the door and they storm in, a veritable stampede. There have to be 75 people of all shapes and sizes, and one with a large boombox. The music blares from the speaker. I race to the bathroom. This is definitely a prison. Since Prentice doesn't want me to go anywhere, he brings everything to me. Hell no. I won't live in fear. Now my blood is boiling. I walk out of the bathroom, opening the door to the right. It's a bedroom, and it must be mine because my comforter is on the bed. I plop down on the bed and lie flat on my back, looking at the ceiling. I feel so lost, broken, and empty. I'm not a slave. If I work for Prentice when he wants and stay here as a prisoner, I'm giving up my life. The odor of cigarettes lingers in the air. The lamp rattles from the bumping in the next room. My door swings open and Morgan stands there with a cigarette in her hand. Come on, you will miss the fun! I open my mouth to answer her, but I can't have fun. My throat is dry, but my next words screech out. I'm going to see Cato! I'm not concerned they can hear me. The music was so loud I can barely hear myself. She nods her head. I understand, but how? She stares at my collar. I know what she's thinking. This collar won't stop me. I only have one shot. I'm sure there's a tracking device in it. I have to break the collar but leave it on my neck. In 20 minutes, slip out the door and run away. She nods in agreement. And get a message to Scott. Tell him to lay low. I sneak out the back door onto the deck. The back fence is tall, at least six feet. I'm going through the front gate. But there the guard still stands. Remembering my magic, I grab the bottle from my purse and pour a little of the potion Cato gave me on my hand. I dig deep into my magic and break the constraints of the collar, but I don't remove it. I continue to the front gate, staring at the guard. When he turns to view me, he gets sick and bends over, holding his abdomen. Down to the ground he falls, his face becoming pale. My visual magic is back. I slip out the gate, racing to the address the woman gave me. Not looking back, I pray Morgan makes it out. I come upon the address and it looks like an abandoned warehouse. A large dragon stands near the door. I take the paper out of my purse to make sure this is the right address. I have heard of Big Sam and seen him around. I've never had a conversation with him. He constantly has the frown of a butcher. Is this a setup? My throat clogs with fear. Are you Harmony? Big Sam says. Yes. Come on in. I pass the large dragon. He is the oldest dragon living, or so I've heard. He looks good for 300. He is also their leader. I always know a dragon. They have a small patch of reptile skin on their forehead. I enter the dark warehouse and continue toward the light at the end of the hall. A small crowd of 20 people are gathered, plotting. I'm not sure what the plans are, but it sounds like murder. Harmony, come on in. Cato says. The elves' leader, and several elves, the shifters, and several witches from the Red Coven are gathered together. This is the first time I've ever seen them in one place together. Here's Harmony, everyone. She has special powers, Cato says. We're having a meeting on how to take that scumbag Prentice out, Jacob says. Jacob was a dragon and a menace who doesn't give a fuck. He's the worst kind because he could take Prentice out and wouldn't think twice. He scowls when Prentice's name is spoken. That's where you come in, Harmony, Tiffany, the coven leader, explains. I hope they're not expecting me to kill Prentice. I don't like him, but I can't kill anyone. I don't want his blood on my hands. He trusts you, and we need to get someone on the inside to wipe out his defenses. As soon as he lets his guard down, we attack. Cato grabs my arm. 
Let me talk to you in private for a second. We walk away from the group as they continue chit-chatting about the battle and how they are going to destroy Prentice. Cato's face was less swollen than when I last saw him. The bruises are fading. I'm sure after the ass-whipping he took from Randy, he wants to get even and settle the score. Everyone here has a reason to dislike Prentice. We could get along for now. We have something in common. Things will get back to normal once Prentice is gone. I'll ask you one last time. Do you want Prentice gone or to break the curse? I scratch my head. I wasn't sure if I wanted to get rid of Prentice or this curse. The healing curse was helpful, and this one time I need it but I'm tired of Prentice coming after me because I can cure. It's draining my body, not to mention it could potentially cause death. I can only have one. I want them both. Why can't I have them both? I think I can. You have only paid one price, Cato says. That's right, I paid with blood. But I still have the rest of the potion in my purse, so after we annihilate Prentice... I will start the process of the curse removal. Besides, I feel better. The tattoo has stopped growing. It's even decreasing in size. Cato and I walk back amongst the group, and the dragon leader gives me a death stare. His stance is defensive with a grimace on his face. Are you in or out? His tone sounds thick and intimidating. I am forced to participate. I want to take this asshole down as much as everyone else here. I'm in. Everyone in the room cheers and laughs. I'll kill the security system. Then the task will be easier. Prentice won't know what hit him. Chapter 21 Standing near the door, I thought hard about running. This is the point of no return. Once I enter, game on. If I'm going to get rid of Prentice, I have to play smart. The smell of marijuana curls underneath the door, causing me to gag. I'm greeted at the back door by a group of teenagers playing beer pong while smoking. I mingle with the crowd as Prentice's baritone voice cuts through the noise. I turn and slither through the underage teens, trying to make it to my bedroom without getting caught. I want it to appear that I've been here the whole time. I get near the hall and bump into Randy. He gives me a mean glare. As I back away from him, my heartbeat is loud enough to drown out the awful music in the background. He grabs me, examining my collar. And the only thing I can think to do is play drunk. I snatch my arm away and slur my words. Let me go! Prentice walks up beside me. Where have you been? Here? Where the hell do you think? I stagger toward the wall. Hey, sober up. I need you. His crazed eyes force me to focus. I got word the Supernaturals plan to attack Prentiss. I close my eyes as if I'm sleeping. Hey, get some water to drink. I need my healer. I tremble and my eyes pop open. His face is wrinkled and red. Is he disgusted with me? I need him to leave me behind so I can knock out the security system and let all the supernaturals into the building. As my abdomen throbs, I bend over and vomit all over Prentice's snakeskin loafers. What the fuck? He screams. Take her to the bedroom and get her a nap. Randy grabs my arm again. I snatch it away, rolling my eyes and mumbling ungodly words. I got it, I got it. I stumble and hit the wall. I stagger to the bedroom and slam the door behind me. I acted well as a drunk. At least Prentice believes it. I'll wait until I think they're gone before I make my move. I have to get to the top floor and knock out all the security systems. I put my ear to the door and hear footsteps in the hall. I race to the bed and dive in, bawling into a fetal position. The door creaks open. I'm not positive who it is, but I'll bet it's Prentice or his foot soldier. I don't know what you are up to, 
But I'm watching you. Remember that. Fuck off, keep watching, asshole. I stay rational and calm, even though rage pulses inside. It's Randy. I don't have to turn around to see his face. I know his creepy-ass voice. His scent of rotten flesh. I hate him for what he did to Cato. In due time, he'll get what's coming to him. Even if he knows I'm up to something, he can't prove it. He has no clue what I'm really up to. I keep quiet, only breathing until the heavy footsteps decrease and the door shuts. I wait in the dark room in silence until I think the coast is clear. The party's still going, with a bunch of underage drinking freeloaders tearing the place to shreds. I don't care. We need the distraction for the plan to work. Morgan must have gotten away. I haven't seen her in the house. I go out into the dining room, making sure Morgan is indeed nowhere in sight. While scanning the room, a fussy boy grinds on me while holding a can of beer. I shoot him a look that clearly asks, Are you fucking kidding me? He stops grinding, backs away, and winks. I roll my eyes and walk toward the living room to see if Morgan is sitting down anywhere. Holding my breath because of the stench of illegal drugs, I look at the couch and see a couple kissing. I can't see the girl's face, but she has a thick build and the same hair color as Morgan. I stare, waiting for them to come up for air. After a few minutes, I tap the girl on her leg. She stops and gives me a puzzled look, lipstick smeared around her mouth. What? She says. I give her a dismissive wave. Never mind, carry on. It's time to make my escape to the top floor. With no one watching, I get closer to the door and my lungs tighten, nearly suffocating me. Every step toward the door gets harder. Prentice could burst through this door any second. As I grab the handle, a large shatter comes from the kitchen. I race out the door and up the carpeted stairs. Thankfully, it drowns out the sound of my footsteps. The hall smells of fresh paint and bleach. I only have eight stairs to make it to the top floor. I walk up the stairs, turning my back to make sure no one comes out of the apartment door. And I step on a shoe. I freeze and my heart stops. I extended my hand and touch what feels like a chest. The labored breathing from the person is loud. I'm hoping it's not Prentice. I'm too scared to run. The hairs on the back of my neck stand. It's fight or flight. I'll fight. I turn around with a swift kick, slamming the man into the wall. It's one of the security guards. He is a small-framed man, not the buff dude from earlier. My cover is blown now. I might as well give it all I've got. He charges toward me, knocking me to the ground. I go tumbling down the steps before landing on my back. I grimace and touch my lower back. It's painful, but not as much as I'm acting like. He races down the stairs, so I extend my leg, tripping him. He lands on his back next to me. I spring to my feet to make a run for it. He grabs my ankle and I land on the stairs. Squirming to get out of his death grip, I concentrate on his spirit, hoping to make him gravely ill. He whimpers and rolls around on the ground. He releases my leg and grabs his abdomen. The music from my apartment is so loud no one heard him. I race up the steps, not stopping until I reach the third floor. I twist the knob, but they locked the door. Shit, what do I do now? I pace the hallway floor. Hell, I've come this far. I charge toward the door and kick as hard as possible. The door bursts open and I trot right in. I've stepped into a spy's room. There are several dozen monitors with different views of the city, all being recorded. I walk toward a box in the corner with dozens of collars inside, waiting on new victims, I guess. Prentice thought he would control crime by enslaving paranormals. I am revolted at the twisted ideas. I continue walking through the halls of the apartment. A door sits at the end of the dark hall. But I came here to knock the security system out so the paranormals can come in. The red lights from the machine glint off the walls. 
It's a huge system with dozens of switches. There are switches for different addresses. Some say electricity, some say wires. I don't know which to choose. I scan the room in search of a manual. I have to find it. Bingo! A thick pamphlet hangs on the wall. There are hundreds of codes for different locations. This just confuses me more. Even so, I have an idea. I flip off the main switch and it shuts all the security systems down. I don't care if it fucks with all his operations. I walk back towards the door when I see one monitor blinking red. I step forward to get a closer view. Morgan is tied to a chair with a gag stuffed in her mouth. Gasping in fear, I grab my head and step back, fighting back tears. I can't cry now. I have to fight for Morgan. Chapter 22 Where is Morgan? Furiously, I try reading the monitors. Silent tears stick to my face. I finally get the location. She's on the second floor. I just raced past the second floor and hadn't seen Morgan anywhere. I have to think smart. I sprint down the stairs. My heart skips a beat. The guard was lying on the floor. Now he's gone. Shit, where the hell did he go? Can't worry about him now. I narrow my gaze on the door. Infuriated, I kick the door in. There, I find Morgan drenched in sweat, crying. My heart cracks at the sight of her. With my trembling grasp, I snatch the cloth out of Morgan's mouth. She lets out a loud sigh. Where were you? I screamed for you. She cries. I thought you left the apartment. We have to go now. I untie her from the chair. My heart heavy. I can't cry. It's a race against the clock. I don't want Morgan to know how scared I am. The guard is definitely coming back. He might bring Prentice with him. I snatch the collar from my neck and throw it to the ground. After all, there's no need to hold on to it. My cover is blown. I help Morgan out of the chair and we spring to the door, only to find Randy standing in the doorway. We both step back. Morgan grabs my arm. I let out a sigh. He walks in, and we continue backing up until we reach the window. You're an ungrateful bitch. He backhands me, and I fall to the ground, holding my face. What type of supernatural man hits a woman? Morgan cocks her fist back with the little strength she has. Randy grabs her fist before it lands on his face. It's okay, Morgan. Prentice walks into the apartment, clapping, while giving me an evil stare. You thought you had me fooled, he taunts. You are quite the fucking actress. His lips tighten as his eyebrows knit together, forming a unibrow. I rise to my feet, letting go of my fear. There's nowhere else to run or hide. I have to face him head on. All the shit I did for you and this is how you fucking repay me. His shout makes the glass windows rattle. My cheeks burn hot from the slap and the anger. My bottom lip quivers. How dare this asshole claim he's done anything for me? Is he kidding? He has made my life a living hell. Done for me? You treat me like a slave, forcing me to be a healer for you. You use people until they're all used up. You only care for one person, yourself. Healing was taking a toll on my body, but you didn't care. You told me to rest because you needed me. I gave you an apartment and took you out of the shack you lived in. I help all the paranormals of Detroit. He squints. You must be out of your damn mind. He snarls in my face. You care so much for the paranormals you were planning to make them all slaves? I arch a questioning eyebrow in his direction. The insult pierces my ears. I can't believe what I'm saying, but it's true. His eyes bulge, and the veins in his neck become enlarged. His hands turn into fists. In my peripheral vision, I see the paranormals rushing through the front door, and my heart pounds in my chest. Either Prentice and Randy will leave in peace, or it will be a war. We can end this now. 
Randy says as he glares at me with a frown sliding down his face. Morgan walks next to me. That won't be in your best interest. I stare him down and shrug. How the hell do you keep busting through the collars? He realizes I can make him sick, so he better back the fuck up. I close my eyes, reaching into my magic, and show him how strong it's gotten. I see sickness within him. I concentrate and realize he has pain in his shoulder from a pinched nerve. The magic tingles within my being. My sight becomes luminous and I glare at Randy's shoulder. His muscles relax and his eyes widen. He rotates both shoulders in a circular motion. How did you do that? I remember Randy saying not all things need to be healed. In this moment, I get what he meant. He gave me a clue without even knowing it. I can't just go around healing people because it takes a toll on me. The sound of a stampede pounding up the stairs holds me frozen. I stand in front of Morgan as Prentice's foot soldiers storm through the door and rush in our direction. One of the soldiers glares at me as if I'm his intended target. I concentrate and strip him of his health. Within a millisecond, he falls to his knees. What the hell is wrong with you? Prentice growls. He was going to attack me. I fold my arms, waiting for the next soldier. The supernaturals swarm in just in time to save our asses. Prentice, I suggest you leave, and quietly, Big Sam says. Cato cuts through the crowd and stops in front of me. Randy, we meet again. The other supernaturals have quieted down, gasping at the showdown in front of us. Randy doesn't say a word, but with his nostrils flaring and his teeth clenching, I'm sure he's ready to battle. Randy lunges toward Cato. I grab Morgan, jumping out of the way. Cato falls to the floor with Randy landing next to him. Cato then jumps to his feet without using his hands. That's all you got? Cato says, standing over Randy. Randy stands to his feet and squares off with Cato. They circle each other and Cato lands the first punch. That starts an all-out brawl, with the Supernaturals and Prentice's foot soldiers cheering them on. Cato slams Randy up against the wall. I broke the fucking curse, Cato says. Randy's face red and sweating. He grabs Cato, swinging him across the room. The floor shakes beneath my boots. I close my eyes as Randy throws a punch. I hate seeing fights. They remind me of the bullying I witnessed in elementary school. Morgan squeezes my hand as my heart hammers against my chest. I'm rooting for Cato to kick Randy's ass, and I know Morgan is too. He took a hard blow across his face, and we nervously watch to see how he recovers. Cato, still on his feet, swings a swift kick that knocks Randy to the ground. I'm overjoyed, although I don't want to show it. While standing over Randy, Cato says, Eye for an eye. I return the curse. He slips the top off a vial and throws it on Randy. His body shakes, rattling the room. It was a small earthquake. The monitors rattle on the table. The chandelier shakes above our heads. Within seconds, all that's left is a skull as Randy's body turns to ash. Prentice's eyes dart around the room. One of his tall, thin soldiers steps toward me, and with one sharp look, he's bent over, holding his chest. Prentice is warning not to fuck with me. Cato walks to my side and nods his head, glaring in Prentice's direction. He doesn't want any more problems. With his hoodoo priest gone, he has no one to cast spells for him. Stop, men. Let's go. All of his foot soldiers exit the place as paranormals stand united, waiting. Be careful, Harmony. This isn't over, Prentice warns before he exits the apartment. We watch as he races from the building. Screams roar from the apartment. Everyone is happy and laughing. The elves, dragons, witches, shifters, we're all celebrating together as one community. I haven't seen this in years. Chapter 23 A week has gone by since the big showdown. 
My powers are back, so I can tell if someone is supernatural, and sometimes what they're thinking. Morgan and I are enjoying the new apartment. It's fantastic, and a new management company has taken over. We lay on the couch watching television when there's a knock at the door. Morgan looks over at me, the rise and fall of her chest more rapid. Who the hell could it be? We're not expecting any company. Prentice knows better than to show his face. I look out the peephole and a big smile graces my face. I open the door to find Scott standing there with a bottle of champagne in his hands. Hey, Scott, Morgan says. Her eyes shift to him as she darts from her seat to give him a hug. We haven't seen Scott in two weeks or more. Prentice had threatened to do something to Scott, so I'm glad he stayed away. I brought a drink to celebrate the new place. He turns and looks at me. And to celebrate your freedom. Freedom. I love the way it sounds rolling off Scott's tongue. I'm free. I can go anywhere I want to go, and I don't have to worry or look over my shoulders. Oh, yeah, and one more thing, he adds as he pulls a small black velvet box from his pocket. I'm going to ask Bethany to marry me. He opens the box to reveal a stunning diamond ring. I embrace Scott. I'm so excited for him. I've gotten over any romantic feelings I had, realizing we are better as friends. I can't say that I don't feel a little sting anyway. I know Scott, and Bethany is not the one. I'm happy for you, Scott, but I gotta run. I'm going to see Mama today. If I don't have anything nice to say, I should excuse myself. If he's happy, then I'm happy for him. I'll lend my shoulder to him to cry on when it doesn't work. The streets are quiet. All the supernaturals realize Prentice was right about the crime. The streets are safer, not perfect, but everyone is helping each other. I hurry to Mama's house, but the faster I walk, the faster the footsteps behind me get. My mouth goes dry and I pick up the pace. Who the hell is behind me? I'm just four houses from Mama's house. The footsteps are nearly on my heels now. I start jogging slowly. Harmony. I freeze and chuckle. I thought it was trouble following me. I twist around and give Cato a hug. How are you, Cato? And stop sneaking up on me. I punch him in the arm. He grabs his arm and grins. Then his smirk disappears and he puts on a more serious face. I know whatever he has to say is important. The fading bruises are nearly gone from his face. I'm glad you didn't take the first step of the cure while I was under Randy's spell. He looks at the ground. It could have gone wrong for you. He doesn't look me in my face, just continues staring at the ground as if he's ashamed. I grab his chin and hold his head up, looking into his eyes. It wasn't your fault. Besides, I finally got a sense of who I am. I know now I need balance. Constant healing without refueling myself can be detrimental to me. I need to strip health from some people and restore health to some. And not everyone needs to be healed. I'm glad everything is better. I'll stop by and see you tomorrow, he says before making his way down the block. Knocking at Mama's door feels different. I grab the knob and twist as the door swings open. It's odd, Mama always has her door locked. She was always fearful of a burglar coming in. There is no smell of food cooking, and the walls are bare. Mama removed all the pictures. I continue to Mama's bedroom to find her throwing clothes in a suitcase. I'm confused and concerned. She never goes outside much because of her mental illness, and now she's packing. Mom, what's going on? Without looking my way, she says, I'm going home. This is her home. What is she talking about? I need to see her eyes. Then I'll know if she's in her right state of mind. Where's home? I ask. I know where her home is. I wanted to hear her response. She looks at me with a grin on her face and her eyes sparkling. Norlands, why do you ask such a crazy question? She laughs. 
She is completely normal. She doesn't have a blank stare. She was born in New Orleans and has family there. But why would she want to leave me, her only child? She continues to fold her clothes. I can't wait to see my sister and all my friends. Harmony, I'm sorry I will miss you, but I'm so lonely here. But you have me. Yes, I do. You can come. No. I shake my head. Mama, my place is here. Detroit. Detroit. 